Hello everybody, welcome to the ISCI annual conference 2021-22. We are going to start the program very shortly. Our moderator for the day is going to uh, start speaking now. Thank you. Hello everyone, I extend a very warm welcome to one and all present here. Welcome to the International Society for Chronic Illnesses Annual Conference 2021-22. I'm Lalita Lavanesh Ries, medical student from Ukraine. Before a few months, attending classes in Ukraine was just a daily routine. But now, because of the recent geopo geopolitical changes, this experience is something I'll remember for the rest of my life. I'm a part of ISEA organizing team, and I'll be the moderator for this conference. Firstly, I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here with us today. We are very pleased to welcome those of you that have been with us for a long time now, as well as those who are new to this organization. So now let me give a small introduction about what is ISCI. The International Society for Chronic Illnesses was started in June 2021 in two nations with about 60 members and one active program. Over the last year, we are pleased to share with you that we have increased our reach to more than 15 nations with 650 plus members and four active programs. Today, the International Society for Chronic Illnesses is celebrating the completion of one year of research, networking, and learning. On this special day, we have organized this conference as a way to virtually share information about performing research as a medical trainee and also will provide a platform for new researchers to showcase their work. We will invite leaders from I. ACI to talk about their experience in research leadership and challenges they have faced. This 
This will be followed by a panel discussion on medical student research mentorship and further prospects with esteemed group of panelists. Now I would like to invite Dr. Purva Shah, founder and president of International Society for Chronic Illnesses to give information about ISEA programs. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Lalita, for such a great introduction for the event. Once again, welcome everybody to the annual conference of ISCI 2021-22. As Lalita said, I am Dr. Purva Shah. I'm the ISCI founder and president. Today, I'm going to talk about four programs of ISCI, which are currently active. And could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So the first two programs are related to research, that's peer research mentorship program. And the second one is trainee-led research collaborative for chronic illnesses. And the second two programs are related to patient care and the beneficiaries of these programs would be healthcare workers. Could I have the next slide, please? Talking about peer research mentorship program. We started the first rotation back in August, 2021. And currently we are in the third rotation of um, this program. To highlight the impact of this program, let's look at some numbers. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Yes. So as you can see in the first rotation, we had about 130 uh, applications. In the last rotation, that was Jan to June rotation, we had about 150 applications. And in the current ongoing rotation, that's July to December, we have a whopping 400 plus applications, mentees and mentors combined. And these numbers highlight the need for medical student research mentorship today. Also to understand the current scenario of research in medical curriculum, I would like to begin a poll. I invite all ISCI members in our Zoom call and also on the YouTube live to answer in the chat box. The panelists and organizing team committee, please feel free to answer this question as well. The question is, were you able to understand and perform research studies as part of your medical school curriculum? That means, right from genesis of the research question to literature search and data collection, while also performing statistical analysis and writing the manuscript and searching for a medical journal and submitting to it later on. Were all these steps taught to you as part of your curriculum? Or did you get help from outside the teaching staff and pre-designed school classes? I will wait for about 10 seconds to get the answers. Kavya, if you find any messages um, on the YouTube live, please feel free to copy paste over here. Okay. So I want everybody to participate in this poll. Please uh, write in the message box if uh, you choose the option A or B, what was your story in research? I believe most of you might have some story and I would like to know about it. So I'll read out some of the answers. Um, Sharon says he had, he was able to perform, but with difficulty. All right, thank you for sharing, Sharon. Yugan said, this was not a part of our regular MBPS curriculum. Platform, yeah. oh, that's so sweet, uh, Yugan. He says, uh, the research mentors at ISCI helped him. Lalita says, um, I was given a little information about PubMed, but not a proper guidance to how to start with and its importance. That's interesting. Thank you, Lalita, for sharing. Karupia also says the op option B, he found uh, help from outside. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Um, I see a lot of Bs, basically. All the answers hinted to Bs, which is really not that surprising at this point. We will talk about this topic later during the panel discussion. Moving to the next slide, I will talk about TRCI. <clears throat> Um, that's a trainee-led research collaborative for chronic illnesses. The goal of this program is to create high-impact scientific literature through collaboration between researchers from around the world and even within a nation from all regions. Under this program, 
we will conduct multi-centric large scale studies or longitudinal long, uh, long term studies. And with the strong task force that is present in ISCI at the moment, I believe our team can make this dream a reality. At the moment, we are finalizing two protocols and we'll publish them hopefully by the end of this year. And I would love to talk about uh, the protocols with you under TRCCI, but let's wait till the end of the year. Uh, we will move to the next program that's LTCP called Lysis of the TB Crisis Program. Uh, talking about tuberculosis in public health point of view, international and national organizations are doing a lot of work in this regard. For example, the United Nations third sustainable development goal is to end the epidemic of tuberculosis by the year 2030. The National Tuberculosis Elimination Program, that's NTEP in India, wishes to accomplish this goal by 2025. Many programs are going on in the country at the moment, and a lot of support for TB research in the form of grants is being provided by the government. So ISCI wishes to join in on this effort and do our bit as medical students and resident doctors in eliminating the epidemic of tuberculosis. Now I will talk about UM4CI, that's, oh, all right. So we have some slides. We have uh, this slide talking about the World TB Day uh, 2022 competition that we had uh, earlier this year. So this competition marked the beginning of LTCP program. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So this slide is about the TB information portal. Dr. Deepti, who is one of the leaders of this project, will talk more about it. It's basically a single information source for everything you need to know about tuberculosis management as a healthcare worker. And now I'll move on to UM4CI. Uh, the full form stands as unconventional methods for chronic illnesses. So almost all of us have followed some sort of alternative medicine like Ayurvedic remedies, homeopathic medicine, or various types of somatic therapies. From drinking homemade neem juice to performing yoga or even being on a diet, all of these comprise the various branches of health management. And especially in chronic illness, patients usually look for treatment methods complementing their allopathic management. This is to lower their dosage of the medication, which will eventually lead to reduction in the side effects and also may increase the effectiveness of their medication. So the need of the R is to shift the current trends in chronic illness management towards a patient-centered holistic care. And to fulfill this need, the goal of UM4CI is to fulfill this need. So thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy today's event. Over to you, Lalita. Thank you, Dr. Purva. I would like to invite Dr. Ilham Zaidi, National Project Head of India, Mentor of Mentors of PRMP programs to talk about leadership and mentorship in research. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really sorry. My camera broke off. I hope you're all doing good. Yes, thank you, you so much, Dr. Ilham. And no problem, please. We, we understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, like, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Purva, uh, Dr. Larita, and everybody uh, everybody else who has been a part of ISCI and PRMP program since the beginning. I was fortunate enough to be associated with the program from its very inception, and I somewhat led the team uh, as being the mentor for all the mentors in the in the program. And I would like to discuss something about how research is planned, how it is different from a from being a researcher than being a mentor researcher, and how leadership is different than mentorship. So with that, I would like to discuss uh, what is research? Why do we perform research? Anybody would request everybody, like, please comment your suggestions, opinions in the chat box. Why do we perform research? What is the need for research? I'll wait for the count of 10.
Thank you. To find better management methods for various diseases, perfect. To fulfill the gaps in the present literature, very good. I would like to agree with both the both the opinions in the comment box. With that, I would like to add that research. I call it a genie, a genie which answers questions that we don't know. And and coming up with questions is a basic student and learner instinct. If you are a student and if you are an enthusiast learner, you will come up with questions that will not have answers written or you know being spoken or addressed by your professor. So those are the questions that we come up, and there's this instinct, uh, inbuilt curiosity to know the answer for the question. If TB is killing around, uh, TB incidence is say what like 10 million uh, person per year, and we know there is no other definitive host other than human. Why are we still not able to eliminate it? While we have eliminated multiple diseases, we have eradicated some of them. TB also has a vaccine. Why, why, why are we, why aren't we able to do that? How do we know that? By calling the genie, the genie research to come and answer our questions. So curiosity leads to research to find out the answer. Answers to the question that we don't know. We don't know yet. And uh, I think that a lot of curiosities that come up in our mind that we do not see answers and we have uh, this hesitancy to go out and reach out to our professors, mentors to ask your questions. Because we may assume that they may think we are stupid enough to ask these questions. But basic questions are the question that leads to actual Olympic curiosity. Next point, Lalita? Yeah. Yes, and that's how once we start research to answer our own questions, research is like an addiction. To be honest, research is like an addiction. You you get you get a, how do I put in what you get in in heart satisfaction once you see a publication coming out. You see other researchers citing your publication. You see other research, researchers reaching out to you to uh, ask you about the question that you use to ask you about the methodology and whether or not they can use your questionnaire. So further learning is done after you have started being a researcher. Uh, then there is no end to the to the further learning. And then we explore research by sharing our ideas, research methodologies, and other uh, other tools with other researchers. And that is how we get skills in research. And that is, I guess, the only way to know more than we have actually studied and to you know be experienced in more than what we have actually experienced. And then come the part of sharing, sharing the knowledge that we have gained over the year, over last 20, 30, 5, 7, whatever years that we have. We do not want that, that knowledge or say that skills to go waste. We definitely want it to put somewhere in use. How do we do that? We pass it on the knowledge to young aspirants, young researchers. That's what keep, uh, that's what uh, keep your legacy alive in the field of research. You feel once, you know, you, 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 your paper getting published you being a researcher is a happiness level three, uh, and your mentee being a researcher is a happiness level five. And then we ensure maximization of learnings by joint discussions on what all have we learned and how we can move ahead with our individual learnings and how we can put them all in one go. Then we guide research aspirants so that they learn from the experts that is you, I don't, I will not call myself an expert, but yes, everybody around here is an expert since we have all have had some good experience in research. And that's how we guide uh, research aspirants so that they can learn more from us and they can be a better researcher than what we are. And maybe, you know, in future, they can, they can produce even further better researchers. And that's how this, this, uh, this process will go on. And uh, more research means answering more unanswered questions. And uh, with that, I would like to add that being a good researcher is totally different than being a good leader. And that is, again, totally different from being a good mentor. Researcher is I can do good. I can, I can establish a well, well 
plan methodology and i can i am a good researcher is being a researcher a uh, leader is how i can guide a team to be a researcher for a research for example if i am a very good researcher but i cannot define on the methodology till the very end and my team has to wait their man hours because of my unplanned and haphazard strategy i can be a good researcher but i am not a good leader and then mentorship is different because in mentorship we don't lead them we work with them as a team while they know they have somebody who can guide them while you are not guiding them you are walking with them step by step and taking them along with you to where you are so that they can go much beyond then where you can where you can anyway be and uh, in mentorship team play is very important and critical part since without uh, being a team player you can be a leader but you cannot be a mentor to mentor you have actually have to show them how to pull a mountain not just tell them and guide them that how they should move a mountain and that's how we reach genesis genesis is a is a like uh, i have discussed it with couple of in like in a couple of other conferences genesis i would call it a metaphor for a mixture it actually stand for something uh, something fruit salad wherein we have we have cut cut slice portion of of banana orange apple pomegranate and everything so that is genesis that's how we become a, a mixture of all the seniors that we have seen experience and be a better version of all of them combined that is it from my side and uh, to be honest i have been approached by a lot of mentors for some of their queries some of them i was able to answer some of them i did not know so i told them that i do not know so let's explore it together and there have been times when uh, like like i said initially that um, this learning process is a continuous process it doesn't end so there are times i learn from my mentors from my mentees and and, and from other young young aspirants that is it from my side uh, i would like to request if anybody would like to come up with something that i may have to deal with any concerns questions queries otherwise that is it from my side thank you very much guys it was lovely being a part of such an amazing team thank you so is there any queries in the chat box youtube chat box or zoom chat box okay thank you dr elham it was very informative now i would like to invite ms ariba sayed national project head of pakistan of prmp program to share about a medical research story coming from a non medical branch hi um i hope my voice is clear so uh let's talk about how a so i'm a social scientist i'm a social scientist and um, by profession i'm a psychologist and working in a medical field as a researcher and, um and i'm just going to talk about how social scientists in a medicine can bring a change so um where a social scientist comes in uh, the field of a medicine they say uh, they contribute to our health and well being by uh, promoting the uh, you know the hygiene thing the uh, importance of mental health the importance of uh, you know taking care of yourself in a very various way and when in the a social scientist can also help us imagine the alternative future the future related to the technologies the different of uh, economical changes and all that thing where uh, as they might save your life there there's the uh, the psychologist comes in and they help uh, they help you to get the idea and the um and the, you know the ability to get out of the state that the mental state which in which might be impacting your um ability to perform well and they can make an impact in your neighborhood as well by 
educating the people about uh, the, uh, you know the viruses, the different kind of um, infections, and how they grow, and how they, uh, you know, they, how if they are airborne or if they're if they're uh, respiratory diseases and or anything like that. And it's uh, and they also uh, are the public intellectuals who train the LSWC, lead health workers, and other. Uh, health workers in addressing the, the very important aspects of healthcare sector uh, by uh, by training them by making them able to understand how to how to communicate with other people how to solve the queries of of the community themselves because you know you can't always go in the community and talk to them because you are not a part of the community. That's where you are going. You are just training the LSFW and uh, the other health uh, staff who are uh, who are addressing the community system. So that's where the social scientist comes in and helps you by uh, helps you training them, uh, the LSFWs and all. But and the social scientists can change the world for better where they talk about the uh, growth and the perspective where they uh, they address the difference of uh, opinion by introducing the um, different aspects in the uh, social science in the world of medical science and uh, in the last uh, they are uh, the, they broaden the horizon of where uh, they can Connect different uh, different departments. They connect with the different uh, aspects where they are. You know, they actually talks about uh, addressing the challenges, the uh, the social movements, the uh, uh, the ecology changes in ecology, and the feminist movement, and everything that can uh, that might can impact the healthcare sector itself. Um, can you change the slide? So uh, that was it about the social, how the social science uh, scientists can impact on medicine. Uh, and here's my journey, how, how I became a, uh, how I became a social scientist in the world of uh, in the world of medicine. So when I uh, joined the, I'm basically from ACU, Aachen University, and I'm working as a researcher there and an ECD educator at ACD. But when I joined in past 2018, I was doing my, uh, my uh, BS, and uh, I talk, I learned uh, about the systematic review. I was passionate about research, so I just um, connected with my uh, one of my professor, and she um, taught me, she mentored me, that how to do systematic review. So that is the time I come, uh, come up with the understanding the aspect how parents uh, can, um, you know, the mental illness in parents can impact the child's well being as well. So that was, uh, that's where uh, my interest in addressing the child's mental health uh, and the uh, environmental factors that may impact the child's mental health uh, emerges. And then I came, then I jumped, um, started my career in the public health where uh, I did a qualitative research uh, in the domain of pediatric oncology under the Harvard and uh, under the Harvard and uh, collaborated with Aachen University where I, saw, uh, where I explored the aspect where uh, that how the medical health professionals are connected, uh, are addressing the concerns of parents and the children who are, um, who are suffering from cancer and all. So I address this that uh, there is a gap, there is a need of uh, a social scientists and a psychologist in the domain of uh, medical and uh, medicine. Where, um, I also, then I work with, with the mobilizing these communities and I, I work in a way where I talk, uh, I educate the LSWs, the uh, lady health workers over here. Um, and I was uh, basically, it was the project where, uh, where the STD virus was spreading in the local health sector and uh, in the local communities, but there was no awareness of uh, of this virus, and they don't they didn't know how to 
how to you know how to protect themselves with this virus so there's where i uh, i connected with them i just uh, i organized a workshop for the lady health workers and the local nurses and the local uh, uh, staff workers for uh, making it a team effort and educating the communities the communities communities are in thousands and millions right so uh, you can actually work um, single handedly in this whole uh, situation you always need a team where you can connect with them and you can you know work in the uh, team and make an impact on the society then i this all uh, just led me to uh, my thesis basically that i i came up with the difference uh, of uh, you know there was a there were very uh, there were many pregnant women who were uh, suffering from mental illness because i am a psychologist as well so i can see that in different areas that uh, this was not uh, addressed so i started my thesis and i was like let's work on it so let's address this the dr ilam also said so it is a new like uh, the research is a new that helps you to explore the various uh, components of what are what might be the uh, causes of this right so i just uh, started that uh, research and i found out that there is no concept of uh, men- mental illness and stigmatization in the domain of um, you know hepatitis c as a virus it's a, it's a, it's just a virus for them and they are not the the doctors uh, were not uh, looking at it in a way from the lens of a uh, social perspective that it can it might be it might be uh, impacting their uh, social life as well it might be um, anything that can cause a stigma in, in the relation might involve in relationship issues or something like this so that was what my findings were out of it and also i took took some uh, workshops in sexual and reproductive health so that i can um, work in this thing uh, more effectively um, then i joined obgyn department uh, where i um, i did my uh, certification teaching in some care giving parental relationship program uh, from burnet center uh, um, in school of nursing uh, is school of nursing university of washington from university of washington then uh, it helps me to become an advocate of early child development and uh, importance of uh, importance of uh, nursing care in thousand days and uh, i worked with the uh, i worked uh, in the way where i developed a workforce development and that, uh, and currently i am doing my phd in uh, currently i am accepted for the phd in medical psychology and psychopathology and uh, um, so let's talk about the challenges uh, so change slide please thank you um so the challenges that i faced were that there was uh, Lack of understanding how social scientists can fit in the society and a medical society, and uh, there were many um, many issues that were uh, addressed by me. Uh, addressed by me that uh, there was lack of antenatal care for high risk pregnancy cases, and uh, there was no maternal mental health development, and there was no very very less uh, resources available for us. um can you see the slide please so um the process that i used uh, in the research where i uh, always look for the gap in the in the research text in the literature and then i look for the what could be the future trend and in, in our society and always i mean i always try to collaborate with different sectors to address if that as these things are interconnected and uh, how the impact can be got by me and uh, what is the challenge that uh, is causing all this uh, whole um, issue thank you so much i think this is it from my side any question anything that you want to ask me
Does anyone have any queries? Uh, thank you, Ms. Ariba Sayed. Your journey is very inspiring to us. Uh, now, I would like to invite Mr. Umardat Kuradat, National Project Head of Other Nations of PRMP, to share his research story in Afghanistan during and after the war. Uh, thank you, Lolita, for that introduction. Uh, I think I might need the host privilege to share my screen. Abhay, could you uh, make uh, Umata the host? Yeah, Umar, I think you're the host now, yeah. All right. I... Oh, sorry. Okay, I think you all can see my screen. Yeah. Uh, let me just... All right, so my research uh, experience uh, in a conflict setting, and I wanna talk about uh, uh, the things that are have happened in Afghanistan. So before that, uh, a brief introduction. I'm a research fellow in the Department of Emergency Medicine here at the Aga Khan University. And I'm also the national project head for other nations uh, at the International Society for Chronic Illness. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Purva Shah for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Omar. Thank you for spending your time with us. Okay. So I do not have uh, any financial disclosure or conflict of interest uh, with the presented material uh, in this presentation. However, uh, much of my research work uh, that I did in Afghanistan was uh, supported by the Johns Hopkins Afghanistan-Pakistan International Collaborative Trauma and Injury Research Training Program. Uh, imagining conflict. So I think that's the question that goes to everyone here on the webinar that what it's like to live in a country with a never ending conflict. Can we all imagine uh, what 38 million people in Afghanistan must have gone through in four decades of political unrest and conflict in Afghanistan? And that's not ending, it's continued to do so. So let's think for a moment about those who live in the conflict zones across the globe. That includes Ukraine, Iraq, Syria, South Sudan, and many other countries. So we can see that the conflict is the, the, the burden of conflict is, is tremendous. So unlike those who are fortunate enough to live in areas not experiencing armed conflict, people living in conflict setting, uh, you know, they confront uh, daily life in, in a highly compromised and, and challenging environment, and they have to share their domestic settings with three different kinds of groups, the armed forces, and then there, are, there is a humanitarian aid industry and so-called observers and witnesses of the conflict. Uh, nonetheless, uh, conflict in any form, uh, be it territorial disputes, uh, the civil war that we see in Afghanistan, the political instability, or transnational terrorism, all have huge social impact on the lives of people. So I think we all can imagine what are the a tremendous uh, impact that you know, conflict can have on individuals. Uh, so moving on to the uh, consequences of conflict, I think there is a huge humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan that has affected millions of people in different regions across the country. Uh, some of the statistics, uh, one third of the 38 million people in Afghanistan is facing food security, including 2 million children who are already malnourished. And Afghanistan has been ravaged by four decades of war. And with the current humanitarian situation uh, that include the earthquake that happened recently, 97% of the population is living uh, in poverty. Uh, the number of displaced people is now more than uh, half million, nearly 80% of whom are women and children. Tens of thousands of Afghans have fled the country, fearing more violence and more Afghans are expected to leave uh, the country in the future uh, due to insecurity. So this is gonna continue, this political instability is gonna continue. And we can see that there is an economic and, and political deterioration. So what, what we mean by that is that, you know, the continuous political instability have curtailed the policymakers, uh, 
thought process which has led to the development of suboptimal short-term macro uh, economic policies that we see today as well. And that's the reason there has been a huge uh, change in the, in the uh, socio-political and economic system in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan is now uh, running short on both workforce and physical infrastructures to meet the healthcare needs of the 38 million population. And we also have lost huge number of young people who were productive member of the society. And without Apart from that, we cannot deny that there has been a huge mass traumatization and development in reverse. So whatever we have achieved in the past two decades have now all reversed and starting reversing in, in many sectors. So why research and conflict setting is needed or why is it important? I think it's difficult to deliver services to affected population and, and conflict affected context where there's a high level of insecurity and populations are keep moving. Uh, there's a disruption in, in supply chains and there's exacerbation of pre-existing uh, shortages of both human and financial resources. So it's, it's really important that we understand the issue from a local point of view rather than we give an international lens to the, to the local issue. And there is also a need to improve evidence and guidance for effective action on various health issues in, in conflict settings. We also need a framework uh, to allocate resources, uh, particularly equitably in, in a conflict affected zone, uh, because we all see that there is a huge resources scarcity in such settings. However, uh, what this equity might look like in, in a conflict setting is still uh, debatable and quite challenging. Uh, so moving on to my research experience in Afghanistan. So the first time uh, that I had the opportunity to conduct a research in Afghanistan was back in uh, 2019. And it was a part of my uh, postgraduate dissertation. Uh, so I conducted this published in BMC Health Services Research. You all can go and have a look at it and read through it. So this particular study uh, aimed to explore the perceptions of the healthcare providers, both in the pre and uh, in hospital setting, uh, including hospital managers and policymakers uh, of the public and private sectors. And, and we found out that there were tremendous challenges in the provision of ineffective trauma care uh, in Kabul, Afghanistan that included uh, inaccessibility to pre-hospital ambulance system. Uh, there was no communication process between healthcare facilities to facilitate transfer. And patient with, with an injury that, that were requiring emergent surgery did not have access to surgical care and in a staffed operating uh, theater within two hours of the injury. And there was no regular assessment uh, of the ability of the emergency care system to mobilize resources, both human and physical, uh, to respond to disaster and other large uh, scale emergencies. Okay, moving uh, after that uh, dissertation, then I had the opportunity uh, to conduct uh, policy dialogue with stakeholders in Afghanistan following year. Uh, and so probably, uh, so after 2019, then in 2020, I conducted this policy dialogue. And, and the aim of this uh, policy dialogue was to actually discuss strategies to position trauma and injury prevention on the priority uh, list of national health agenda. And from this uh, policy discussion, uh, so basically the key, holder, the key stakeholders in, in this policy dialogue were uh, Ministry of Public Health that included the Department of uh, Monitoring and Evaluation, Department of Communicable and uh, Communicable Disease, Non-Communicable Diseases and Injuries, and there were academicians from Aga Khan University, George Washington University, and the Johns Hopkins University, and, and we, we came together to discuss this important issue, and, and we prioritized some action plan for the for the following years uh, that included the establishment of uh, injury surveillance system in Afghanistan and incorporating injury module into the demographic health survey 2021. And we also thought of uh, doing some advocacy work for injury prevention through policy brief and building the institutional capacities on injury research. Another a research experience uh, in Afghanistan. So I interviewed this community health workers in Bamiya, which is one of the remote areas uh, on the use of mobile application for improving immunization coverage. So community health workers uh, actually can become a potential uh, workforce in a conflict setting, and they, they can ensure access to essential healthcare services. So in Afghanistan, there are more than 20,000 community health 
uh, workers uh, that are serving as village primary care providers and they're functioning as a liaison between the community and the healthcare facilities and working as community developers. So more than, and, and then the, the best thing about uh, this community healthcare workers is that then half of them, and in fact, more than half of our women. So uh, since they're uh, deployed voluntarily and then their uh, retention becomes a bit difficult. However, community participation, uh, I'm sorry. So community participation facilitates the task of community health workers, uh, but that also poses uh, challenges because traditional leaders uh, on, often influence the recruitment of the community healthcare workers, and and that may not be the best choice for the communities that you know. Employment of this community health workers uh, largely is uh, influenced by the traditional leaders of those communities. So then probably they can influence the deployment and they may not have the right people uh, deploy those communities. Uh, moving on to challenges for conducting research in Afghanistan. Uh, so ensuring safety of the research team uh, in all the phases of the research is highly important and essential that uh, uh, as a research uh, team do a risk analysis to identify uh, the potential risks uh, that may pose threat team and having said that uh, the risk can change quickly and the, and the perception of risk and liability differ so it's it's really important that you can plan as well uh, there are some ethical issues involved in uh, conducting research in conflict settings. so for instance uh, there is a high probability that uh, you may be traumatized the events in conflict setting during research process uh, there are also complex permission process for research. So for instance, when I conducted research in Afghanistan, there were so many firms that were starting off with the uh, Institute Review Board approval and then going in each hospital to take separate permissions uh, to, co uh, to conduct data collection. So that was a pretty complex process. And it, it's awful uh, difficult to access key stakeholders and, and conflict settings for research purposes. Uh, uh, the collaborators on ground may be uh, more interested to use uh, the research funds for service delivery rather than research programs. So there is there is a huge competing interest, and then there may be some disputes arising for uh, from a potential competing priorities between the stakeholders. Uh, so some of the learnings that I've had from my research experience in Afghanistan, and I would like to share them uh, with you all. Uh, I think uh, we should really consider COVID as blessing in disgust, because uh, we have learned uh, to make the most of to make the most use of this virtual space during uh, COVID for various learning needs across different disciplines, and that can be applied to build uh, the capacity of the uh, local researchers uh, through innovative uh, strategies, and. It's also important to make sure that your research is not fueling the existing tensions in societies and, and politics, because then it will have a counter effect for future collaborations and research work. So when you're doing any research in a conflict effect setting, you gotta make sure that you're not doing anything that can fuel the tension in, in, in the stakeholders and in the political and sociopolitical system. So that's something that you have to be quite careful about. Uh, develop strategies and mechanism to mitigate uh, the possible risks uh, the context may pose for you and vice versa. And you need to set up adequate personal safety and data security measures for researchers and ensure uh, sensitive data management and anonymization of resources. And it's also important to understand uh, the interest of the stakeholders in the research outcomes. And as a research team, uh, you should clarify roles and responsibilities with the stakeholders uh, to establish a mutually uh, beneficial partnership. And, and this can be done uh, by diversifying your research networks and communicating transparently. Uh, you should also consider, uh, uh, you know, different dissemination channels and language issues to ensure that a scholarly community uh, and employers are learning from, from the research output, uh, but also prevent the uh, disclosure of, of sensitive data. So that's all from my side. Thank you for having me.
Thank you, Mr. Umar, that for such a great insight into the problems one face in conducting research in war torn regions. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Deepti Bandaru, leader of Lysis of TB Crisis Program 2022-23 and a winner of World TB Day 2022 competition to speak about ISCI TB Information Poetry. Thank you, Lalita, for this generous introduction. And hello, everyone. This is Deepi. Uh, hello. Could I interrupt for one minute? Yeah. yeah. Kumal, could you please uh, give the host privileges to uh, International Society for Chronic Illnesses, that account? Sure, sure. I just got that. Thank you. Kenny? Yes, Deepi, please continue. Hello, everyone. This is Deepi, and uh, I'm happy to say that I won the I, sorry, LTCP 2022 poster presentation competition, and uh, I'm the leader of. A 2022 LDCP program and also there is another leader Dr. Sheshi Khan unfortunately he couldn't attend this conference and uh, firstly I want to thank Dr. Purva and ISCI team for organizing the competition and also this conference today uh, I'll speak about the information portal uh, could I have this slide okay uh, okay firstly what is the need for TB information portal See, tuberculosis is one of the most prevalent infectious diseases in developing countries like India, Pakistan and other countries. And But most of the people don't know about the programs and schemes that were brought by government and non-governmental organizations. So uh, this TB information portal helps uh, many healthcare workers and people to have all the information at one place so that uh, they'll come to know all the schemes that are implemented by the governments. And also the persons uh, that are mostly benefited by this LTCP program is the healthcare professionals and trainees from all over the world. Anyone can access the information uh, from this TB information portal. Uh, to create this portal, we have divided the team members into groups like a, a guidelines for prevention and treatment group and a demography group and uh, some team members will work for collecting the latest developments in research and uh, also to collect the latest news. So we have divided the team members into several groups and will be the collecting the information and so that we'll have all information at one place. And uh, then coming to the future plans and goals of this LDCP program is of this information portal is um, after collecting all the information, we'll take the feedback from healthcare workers and also we'll make changes according to their advice. And after collecting all the information and making the required uh, changes, we'll disseminate this information to all the healthcare workers, which is very important. And also, uh, we'll try to reach out to the people so that they also will come to know all the schemes that are implemented by the government. Yeah. Thanks for giving me this opportunity, Dr. Kumbar, to share info about the information portal. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Deepti. Great work on TV information portal. Now I would like to invite Dr. Suganya Karikalan, Chief Organizer of ISEA Annual Conference, to welcome our panelists and moderate the panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Dalita. Hello all, a very warm welcome on my behalf. Hearing all the experiences from my fellow team members was really a great look back on the journey we have had as a team for the past year. I'm glad to be a part of this amazing team. Now, let's move forward with our main event, our panel discussion. As we were brainstorming a topic for our panel discussion, we had multiple topics and questions in our mind. But being a team where we had been exploring research mentorship and uh, uh, bringing up new projects for the past one year, we had many ups and downs. Um, the topic which gave rise to multiple questions and doubts was 
medical student research and the future prospects. As we began our journey during the initial periods of ISCI, finding mentors, researchers to guide, organization and collaboration between team members was our main main struggle. There was a void on how to start, what to do and who to approach. As we had members adding up to the team, we began getting numerous suggestions and guidance. Dr. Purva was a great leader. She is a great leader who listens to and values suggestions from anyone. Now, at the end of one year, we have better knowledge to initiate a research question and go ahead until the publication of a paper and reviewing papers. Thus, our annual conference panel discussion topic was chosen as medical student research and prospects as it would enhance our current knowledge and serve as a great knowledge base for a valuable audience and team members. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Let me introduce our panelists now. Uh, first, we have Dr. Nadar Shah, founder of the first online community that uh, Dr. Nadar Shah I'm inviting first, uh, founder of the first online community that uh, provides peer-to-peer -peer coaching, tutoring and mentoring services for medical students pursuing US medical residency, the MedFox Academy. The MedFox blog has constant interesting updates on medical residency, pathways and experiences of fellow applicants. Uh, Dr. Shah, please tell us more about the beginning of MedFox Academy. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for everyone for organizing this. It's it's really amazing seeing the growth of ISCI in these last few months and uh, uh, speaking with Dr. Purva Shah throughout the whole process and really congratulations for all your growth. And uh, I, I started MedFox Academy with uh, with really this, this idea that um, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, very similar to the, the vision of uh, ISCI, that peer-to-peer -peer mentorship is really the best way um, to, to provide mentorship, right? So me medical students understand the struggles of other medical students and how to overcome those struggles through USMLE Step 1, through Step 2, through the residency application process. So that's really the vision that I started MedFox Academy with. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nadar Shah. I welcome you on behalf of the team. Next, we have a junior medical doctor from Anaja National University, Palestine, Dr. Dua Shala, a young researcher from Palestine, the CEO of The Researchist, a community that aims to transform research as a youth language in the fields of humanities and social sciences. She is involved in multiple roles. She, uh, uh, she is the associate editor and director of recruitment in the HPHR journal, an Elsevier student ambassador, and the ambassador for Palestinian Forum for Medical Research. It's special to have you as your panelist today, Dr. Dwashela. Please tell us more about the researchers. We'd like to know more. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure being among all of you. Um, so the researchers, it began as an initiative here in, uh, in Palestine uh, in 2019 uh, between us as a medical students that uh, we had uh, issues in learning and doing research in my faculty. And so we decided to do that initiative. And this initiative uh, between us has began becoming bigger and we extended outside our university as we reach out to other medical students uh, at Pal in Palestine, um, and uh, we started doing uh, working into uh, things mainly by offering students, uh, mainly medical students, uh, a research methodology trainings, and offering them the opportunity to do re uh, research outside the curriculum, and so they can uh, do research and um, advance their CVs and uh, help them also to get the research experience they need as to become a future doctors with evidence-based practice skill. Your story is so inspiring. Thank you for being here, Dr. Duha. Can't, can't wait to hear what your thoughts on medical student research. Mm. Next, we have... Shoot, go on, Nikki. Next, we have our wonderful future pediatrician and a passionate researcher from India, Dr. Avantika Chaitan. With research becoming an integral part of the profile of international medical students, finding guidance is a very hectic process. 
Dr. Chaitanya makes it easier through her Otto Research Initiative, a free research initiative to help international medical students and graduates with research training. It's a pleasure to have her on panel for today. Please share a few words about the Otto Research Initiative. Hi, uh, thank you for having me, Dr. Purva, and a very warm welcome to every other panelist and everyone listening in to the conference today. And thank you for that wonderful intro. So regarding the Auto Research Initiative, and I'm really um, happy to be on the panel here with my co-founder as well. So we started this as um, as a gateway to, for like IMGs who have no little to no background in basic research met methodology to actually start learning a bit more about research, about manuscript drafting, about publication, about just the basic processes. We started off thinking that we would at least help 10 to 15 IMGs as much as we can, but it definitely grew and that made us realize the gap in research curriculum uh, that we face, especially as Indian medical students, and especially as medical students in most of the countries, except the ones that actually, you know, um, do have a focus on research. So that was the main reason that we started Auto, and uh, we're really, really happy to, you know, be a part of all the organizations and committees who have joined us in actually making this, uh, you know, pu putting this forward. So yeah, I'm actually really happy to be here and happy to share my share our thoughts about how um, research and um, just like how it's important for like medical students and how we can actually propel forward research learning and research um, and make it more, you know, accessible to everyone across the world. Thank you. I welcome you all on behalf of the team. Another incredible find in our panel discussion was Dr. Sharad Jawedi, co-founder of the Otto Research Initiative and an enthusiastic researcher with over 13 published peer-reviewed papers. It is indeed astonishing to hear that Dr. Jawedi had his first publication during his third year of medical school. Kindly share with us what led to your research paper during the third year of your medical school and how it fueled your research passion. Thank you for that. A uh, wonderful introduction, I'm kind of flushed. Um, but yeah, so, well, I mean, I, I've always been a curious kid and I always ask questions. So when I got into med school, uh, especially like those of you who study in, in, Indian, uh, in, in Indian med schools, you know that, you know, you're not really uh, encouraged to ask questions. You're, you're, it's more about, okay, do you know what you were supposed to know and then move on to what you, what you because there's so much to know, right? You're not really encouraged to explore on your own. But me being me, I got into, like I got involved in a couple of studies and I have been fortunate to have had one or two professors in my uh, college who were um, passionate about research, encouraging about research, and they actually allow, you know, took me on, allowed, guided me, okay, this is what you do next, this is what you do next, this is what you do next. And um, it was a struggle, the first publication, the ADHD one, it was definitely a struggle, but I mean, we, we did, we, we got it published. Um, and I think, uh, and any, anybody here who's published a research paper understands this, the, when you see that publication online or in print, and when you see your name on it, it's not just your name, it's like when you see a body of work that you worked on, and you've created something out of nothing. And I feel that that is really something that's worth pursuing. So Avantika and I basically, uh, we met up, we talked about a few research papers, we published a few of them. And then, you know, like she said, we, we thought we'd help a few people along the way, but we found out that, okay, it's not a few people, it's a lot of people. And it's not just India, it's like across the world, it's the same. So uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this talk. I think this, you guys have really picked a very, very important topic um, to talk about medical students and research genuinely uh, it'll be it'll, it's gonna be a good discussion glad to have you on the panel dr javeri looking forward to hearing your thoughts um, global association of indian medical students often referred to as the games is a team that serves as a hub focusing on helping students address the issues of medical education to provide efficient education to all indian medical students to achieve excellence 
Dr. Tharun Kumar Suwari is the current national president of the Games. It's delightful to have you here, Dr. Suwari. Can you share with us the latest issues that are being faced and addressed by the Games? So I think Tarun is traveling at the moment. He's getting some prize and that's why he's going from his place to another state. Uh, he will try to uh, be active whenever he gets a network and we can move forward um, if he's not able to participate. Okay, okay. Yeah, I get that. Um, I once again welcome all the panelists. So let's move forward. Let me explain the format of, of our panel discussion. Our panel discussion consists of five questions chosen by the team. A question will be asked and panelists can start sharing their thoughts on it. And the timing will be for like two minutes approximately. After two minutes, a time of notification will be made upon which our next panelists can begin. Uh, Dr. Abai will demonstrate the timer sound. Abai? Hello. Oh, can uh, can uh, yeah, you, uh, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Can well, thank you very uh, much for demonstrate. inviting me. But uh, I just like to make some changes that I'm not a doctor yet. I'm Mr. Okay. So the thing is, I Sorry. just want to explain you that you have been given two minutes to answer your questions, and after the two minutes of your time, the buzzer will ring. So you have only two minutes. That something that you need to keep in your mind. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Abe, can you demonstrate the timer again? Sound again? Yeah, and that's the budget sound, but you have been given only two minutes to answer the question. After the time will complete, the budget will sound. So th this shows that your time is finished now. Okay. Um, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. So it's not very strict. Don't worry about it. You yeah. can go a bit here and there. Just we just want to know your thoughts. So just so, yeah. Yeah, the timing is not very strict. You can take your own time. And uh, uh, the order of uh, discussion for each question for the panelists will be displayed um, on the screen. So um, if there are any questions from the panelists, um, they can ask them. You have any queries before we begin? Okay, so let's begin with our first question. So the first question is, um, does the involvement of medical students in research impact new developments in the medical field? What is the extent of this impact and how would this benefit medical science and our patients? Uh, we can begin the discussion. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Duha can begin. Okay, so for your question, I would say the answer absolutely that uh, student research will come back to new developments, but not right away when you just start doing research. As I would say that the area you start have your training in research, and at least not for, let's say, in my, my sitting that I'm living in Palestine, uh, with the health system that we are in, getting an, a research experience at least, um, and having getting the familiarity with the work in research and this training would absolutely um, get you um, more directed to get better choices after you finish your degree and uh, will direct more your work after that in residency and after, after it as a future doctor as a, or a specialist. And even though it would be also guide you more in the career path, maybe as an academic. So um, absolutely. That's my answer. Uh, thank you. Um, we can proceed with Dr. Ventika. Yeah, so my opinion on involving medical students and how it how it actually impacts research is I feel that um, if you're like a practicing physician or a, or a practicing attending physician who has like so many patients and a lot of workload, you might be wanting to do research, but you won't really have the time to go hands on and collect data and, you know, um, 
do like most of the like the like interview patients and you know collect like lab reports or whatever you need for your research so i feel that in that way because medical students are also like they're in the hospital most of the time and they're actually interested to learn how to do research involving medical students in if you are an attending physician involving medical students in actually doing research would actually benefit you or benefit the professors who are actually taking them on because they'll actually get a lot of work done quicker Well, medical students, I've definitely like I was a medical student and I had to do like a research project in pediatrics. I remember that I would like go out of the way and actually like stay back for like five, six hours, collect data from patients and, you know, um, talk to the patients, get their vitals, everything. So you would get a lot more of like as a medical student, I would get a lot more hands on experience than as a doctor, like the doctor who was helping me uh, with the research and he was also publishing it. He also got a lot more data than he expected. So it's a win win situation for like both the parties, definitely. And it does definitely benefit medical science as a whole. Because uh, every like if there's a research project that's been stuck for a very long time that hasn't been moving on, involving medical students definitely in like helps helps them get it push it forward because medical students will definitely be more active and they will have more time on their hands to actually help the research project move along. So this is going to benefit medical science as a whole, and I feel that almost like every medical uh, college uh, who have participates in the ICMR in India should actually try this out. Should actually try involving more medical students in research projects. so that i feel that that will benefit almost every single person who is interested in research thank you dr avantika uh, we can um hi uh, dr sharan yeah so um i think i agree with what most of uh, dua and avantika said um i think just a couple of things one is it's a symbiotic relationship the medical student benefits from the experience um he he or she benefits from understanding what goes on like it's not just okay you're looking for you're looking at the literature you're collecting data and you're uh publishing it there's a lot of paperwork there are a lot of permissions there is a lot of a lot of design like so many people just skip out on research design you have to spend more time actually designing the study rather than actually collecting data collecting data is an afterthought right but so what i see in in current practices most physicians themselves are in trained so when you have practicing physicians trying to lead research it usually leads to okay studies because you you will have improperly designed studies and yes the fundamentals will be there but they won't be designed well enough to get published anywhere anywhere nice so my advice would be if you're a medical student the first paper you work on should be with either a, a psm professor a, a psm is preventive and social medicine so somebody who's in public health basically talk to people in public health and get a paper work on a paper with anybody in public health you will understand all the different steps of systematically approaching a paper and finishing it right once you've gone through that process you understand all right these are the different things i need to do then you get involved with with actual practicing physicians because if you look if i'm a practicing physician i don't like a publication for me unless i'm an academic is not going to help me a lot right so for me what i will be able to provide you is the data because patients are coming to me right that's what you need to keep in mind right that the physician all the physician is going to do for you is give you data if he or she is academically inclined fantastic you're one of the lucky few medical students who actually have somebody like that around you most people don't so start with somebody in public health work on a paper or two and maybe involve somebody uh maybe once you've worked on a paper and you actually do well uh the second paper you can actually get a consultant physician on board so that you have somebody looking after the um the structure and design of the study and you have somebody providing you patients as well right so i think that's how you should approach it and as far as medical students being involved i feel it's important but it's difficult when there is no incentive for the medical student um because if you don't really like if 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 there is 
really no no point of if if it's not going to help me in any way apart from just giving me the experience and giving me like giving me a chance to exercise my curiosity it's going to be really difficult for medical students to get involved in research in the first place because it's a tiring 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 uh and uh, you know you it's it's really tiring and then yes there are benefits to it but then there has to be some sort of incentive some sort of real incentive to a medical student somewhere down the line for them to actually be involved and be persevere, uh, persevere um you know persevere through basically yeah so that's my answer to that thank you um uh, dr uh, tanu kumar if you're available you can speak me yeah so sorry for the inconvenience so i didn't expect that time will become 6 hours late so yeah can i ha- can i have a question uh, again like question yeah uh, the question was does involvement of medical students in research impact new developments in the medical field what is the extent of this impact and how would this benefit medical science and our patients yeah definitely if we see the involvement of undergraduates from past and now like in research the the incidence like the rate is very much increased and today's uh, doctors are tomorrow's post graduates or clinicians where they would conduct a, some they may they have a chance to conduct a ground breaking research so at, at an early career like at early stage like undergraduate if they get to know about research methodology and various types then they may able they have an extra edge so that they can do some productive research during their post graduation or as an academician or as a clinician so if you see i encountered while working with my post graduates so they are very busy with their routine clinicals and the exams so they may not give their best in their research and they found very hard to time like they found very hard time to learn research at the post graduation so if Uh, they like if they feel that if i have an early exposure during my undergraduate so that i can uh, take less time to uh, understand more research methodology or any other related to things to research and can give their best uh, during their uh, post graduation so definitely as today's budding doctors are tomorrow physicians and physician scientists so it's need of the hour that students should at least exposed to research at their undergraduate level So done um, from my end. Thank you. Um, we can move ahead, Doctor Nadarsha. Yeah. So um, I th- I think the problem of being part of uh, such a distinguished panel is that uh, there's very little to add uh, after everyone's spoken, especially when I'm last. So, uh, but but if I could uh, but if I could build a little bit about uh, on what Sharon has said, I think his uh, he absolutely hit the the nail on the head. Uh, when he emphasized the importance of design um i think and i'll speak uh for for the united states uh research here that we're in a a big reproducibility crisis um uh, i think uh like in, in the the journal nature talked about uh about 70% of researchers tried and failed to reproduce the the research of other researchers so Uh, to me this is a disaster of medical research but it's also an opportunity for medical students to really focus on better design um uh, and it's become so sad that like i th- i think um in it, with the reproducibility project they tried to replicate uh, cancer studies between 2010 and 2012 and only about 25% were able to be reproduced and these are studies that initiate clinical trials for our drugs that we have today so kind of gives you um uh, uh, and a perspective on where where we are with drug development um but Dr. Shah uh talked about like unconventional methods for chronic illness and we see we see a vast majority of research for for one reason or another being directed away from natural remedies and towards uh pharmacological uh treatments now this isn't to say obviously that me- uh, pharmacological treatment hasn't led to uh, an abundance of uh, healthcare improvements uh, throughout the world but um if we see that there's more natural remedies to 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 be uh, taken into account that can that that have little change on our physiology why not engage in that research 
Um, so I think these issues give a, a unique opportunity for the new generation of researchers to really become leaders in, in medical research. So to answer the question, absolutely. I think medical students can come into the research industry with a, with a fresh perspective on how to approach research and to engage in responsible studies. Thank you. Thank you all for the wonderful answers. So um, we'll now move to the second question. Uh, there is no consistent structure within the medical education for involving medical students in research. How can this be addressed? And consequently, many students struggle without any guidance on how to start conducting research. What would we suggest for them? How should a beginner start research? Um, in regards to uh, the lack of consistent structure in me medical education, I think this is exactly right. Um, and this is really a problem with uh, centralized education. It's always lagged behind the demands of, uh, of, of society, right? So uh, I'll speak for like American public schools, for example, we, we see that the medical, the, the education structure rather, like from elementary school to high school, it's really been the same for the last few decades. Nothing has changed despite the rise in technological innovations and different ways of learning, right? Um, and even medical education since uh, in the United States, at least it, it's been li very little has changed since the publication of uh, what we call the Flexner report in the early 1900s. Medical education has changed very little in the United States since then. Uh, but, but I don't think this is an excuse. Uh, my thoughts on change and, uh, and what many of the presenters really demonstrated here is that you should never wait for the incumbents to give you permission to change the status quo, right? You, you'll never get permission to change the status quo. Instead, I would recommend to partner with different innovators in the industry to really bring about change. And um, we're really an incredible time in networking today. And there's countless resources to learn about medical uh, research. But the best way I think is to start locally. Uh, Dr. Ariba uh, mentioned that researchers practicing in communities uh, should understand their community. That's, that's really the, the, the hallmark of research, right? Is to understand your communities in which you're working in. So start in the hospital or clinic in which you're rotating, partner with a physician to even start with case studies. One step forward is really the, the best experience to start your career in research. Yes, so can I continue? Yeah. yeah, please. Okay, so coming to the Indian perspective, so we all know there is no, for postgraduates, they need to do a basic course in biomedical research. It's mandatory in order to apply for their final exams. But for undergraduates, there is no such rule. And there is no mandatory that you should do research or should involve in research or should do any research in Madhuri course. So basically, students will get to exposure to research when they are in third year of their school, when they study the social and preventive medicine. As a part of the awards, they may ask you to do small surveys and present it as a poster or etc. Otherwise, uh, if any, like this is student research societies plays a key role in uh, encouraging students to, um, to do research. I have seen many colleges where there are student research bodies where they will encourage their juniors to, to uh, from first year to final year, they will encourage to apply for ICM or STS or any university grants or any extramural grants, extramural grants, etc. So that is the one good way. Otherwise, uh, as we all know, if you don't have a way, create your own way. Now there is so many online sources where you can find uh, many videos related to research methodology. Even the NPTEL Swayam has kept the entire health research fundamentals and basic biomedical research course as a free videos in YouTube. You can see and learn. You can attend research methodology workshops in any conferences and you can learn. So if you have that zeal and enthusiasm, so nobody can stop you. You can easily find your own way and through collaborations through organizations like ISCA and many other organizations are providing the mentorship programs. Many things are happening now so they can easily learn through these various possible ways. All right, thank you. Should I continue? Yes, please. 
Okay, so um, adding on to what Dr. Hassan and Dr. Tharun said, I think uh, I'd like to address this uh, issue regarding the USMV perspective, because that's what I've seen like happening to most of the undergrads and grads preparing for the USMV. It's like uh, everyone knows that you have to write your steps, but once you're like writing your steps or you're done with one step, suddenly there comes a question like, what research have you done? And for most of us in med school who have zero to no knowledge about like basic research methodology or how to actually start, you know, working on a research, it's really hard to, um, you know, suddenly realize that you need to actually put something on your CV or on your resume about research while knowing that you have none. So that gap is really hard to fill, especially because like uh, while applying, I do know that most programs do require at least like some background in basic research. So um, adding on to like how you would start um, research if you have zero background, I think um, as Tarun said, there are a lot of websites and a lot of YouTube um, channels that currently have like free research uh, training. I think the NIH has a free research course that is uh, accessible till, was it till June or July 30th, I believe it was accessible to everyone. So there is a lot of like uh, training source material online. But personally, I feel that the best way to actually learn research is by is by getting into it and doing it on your own. Like the way I learned research, it wasn't by reading, um, you know, um, or, or like doing a course. It was by, by actually like working with someone who taught me like step by step. Because it's like when you're actually working on something, that's where you know, okay, so these are the errors that can happen, but this is how I'm supposed to draft the manuscript. This is how I'm supposed to check for plagiarism. This is how I'm supposed to write. So there are like these basic things that, you know, uh, not every course or every material online will teach you. So actually, I feel like, you know, if someone's, if, if you have a senior or if you have a mentor who can guide you step by step, I think that is the best way that you can definitely put yourself in the field and start learning about research. And I was adding on to Dr. Um, what Dr. Nader said, I think definitely about uh, if a medical student wants to start, the best way would be to actually uh, start with a case report or a case study because that's like the easiest and uh, way to like actually um, start, uh, you know, putting your foot into research because you'll definitely see an interesting case when you're um, in med school and you obviously want to write up about it. So why not actually turn that into a publication? And I know, while I know that writing is hard and writing, drafting a manuscript is hard, that is one of the, one of the simpler ways where you can actually start, uh, at least like start working on it independently or with the help of a professor who is actually seeing the patient. So being a medical student, I think, and if you have zero background in research, writing a case report or a case study would actually be a very beneficial way to actually learn about the, the nitty gritties of manuscript writing and publication. Thank you. Dr. You want me to, uh, yeah, 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 you want me to go ahead? Okay. So I think uh, Avantika pretty much laid out my, you know, our, in, our shared philosophy of uh, research in general that um, all of these online resources that are available, training programs, uh, I, I find that all of them are super awesome for exposure. They will teach you, they will explain to you that, okay, these, these are the tools that are out there, or this is the process that is out there. But you, it's like, you can't learn to fish by seeing a YouTube video, right? When you see a YouTube video of somebody fishing, you will you'll understand that okay, that you have you, you'll understand a little bit of the technique, you'll understand what you know, you know, take in some tips, something here and there. But when you actually are at the pond and you put it, you know, you're actually fishing, that's when you that's the that's the experience that you're gonna take home with you. Right. So um I don't think I have any anything much more to add after Avantika. Uh Dr. Nadar, I completely agree. I, I, I feel you, man. I feel what you were going through. Uh, with an experienced panel, you there's really not much to say. But um, sharing from like what Avantika and I do at Auto, this is precisely what we are working on. That we work on with teams, and we work. You know, it's you learn why on the job. That's the whole point. That's that's our whole approach to teaching research. That you will learn far more by making mistakes, and then you know us helping you out and making you understand, okay, you know what, maybe this is a better way of doing something. And that's how you learn. It's, it's mistake after mistake after mistake. And uh, for getting started, I'll just say one last thing. Um, 
make sure the person you are taking your guidance from like uh, make sure that that person actually knows what they're doing because a lot of the time if you are misguided and if you're young and you're starting out and you're misguided you will end up hating research for the rest of your life okay so the right mentor like that i think for like the first step one is writing case reports like avantika and everybody has mentioned step zero is to find is to figure out who to work with so make sure you spend a lot of time figure you know understanding has that person published in you know if it's case reports you're trying to work on work with somebody who publishes case reports regularly somebody who's and who doesn't just publish in quantity but like publishes in good journals publishes in places where you need a lot more than just a manuscript you know uh i think those things are far more important for a medical student like you have to understand that mentor selection actually plays a very big and it has has a huge impact on basically how your research journey is going to be so take care in that i feel thank you so yeah it's my turn so uh, actually i agree with a lot of what have been said uh, by our dear panelists but i want to say something Uh, regarding our um, experience at the research is that uh, medical students especially they got rushed they when they first they won't start research they want to do research but, but we always say get familiar with the concepts of research get a, a really good background in research and opportunities will come through the way once you have got the the at least the basics um and um, as a sitting in uh, Uh, as Palestine, that even clinicians that do, doesn't have that much of, uh, let's say, that um, background in evidence-based practice, and so we're doing research. We struggle also to find mentors, even though we um, we guide the students to search for mentors and to, to have someone, a university professor, a senior, uh, uh, even a medical student who is experienced in doing research. uh really i would um rephrase this that uh, choose a person that you will guide you in the right way and not just end up misguided or in the wrong way and uh, i want to also say that um right now we can ha we have the opportunity to network out not just locally out you know and internationally or regionally so wh when you have the opportunity to network with other student medical students in other countries they're doing uh, collaborative research or any other type of research, why not uh, take the chance also to do so? And uh, also we, we, we say to students, and we've uh, touched this at the researchers when we work with the students, that uh, sometimes uh, they feel research as a burden. And when they, when they want to begin, they feel, um, I, I hate research or I don't want to do research. It's just, uh, I, I just want to focus on medicine and I don't care about research. But we say, Um, find the way that uh, you really enjoy learning and choose that way to, to learn research. If you are one of the people who enjoy reading or one of the people who enjoy listening to podcasts or enjoying uh, watching YouTube or going to trainings or whatever the way you enjoy learning, go and choose the way and search for the resource that you would find research material about that uh, way of learning research. Um, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful thoughts. Um, we can move ahead uh, to the third question. Most medical student research papers are based on clinical subjects as compared to preclinical subjects. According to you, what could be the reason for the inclination of medical students to perform research on clinical topics? And how can this be addressed? How can we focus, uh, shift our focus to non-clinical topics too? Uh, Dr. Sharon, um, yeah, so this is a very interesting question. I think um, I, most of like, I, I'll, I'll be open with you guys. Most of my research has been clinical, um, but so I, I, I'm recently, I've been, uh, I've been working with a couple of, with the scientific com committee at our university and we have, AI researchers and pathologists, genome, you know, genomic specialists, bioinformaticians, 
and everybody's coming together and we're trying to, you know, we meet up every week, we talk about research in everybody's field and then we try to figure out, can we make, a, can we do something about it? So coming like in India and in a lot of different countries, I, I, I feel um, most medical students don't have pre-med. We go straight into med school. So right after high school, you're not learning biology. You are learning anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. Um, and after, like, so the, the point is when you start, when, when you, it's, it's, it's really difficult to get involved in basic sciences research if you don't have that time that a lot of other nations do, a lot of other people do have, you know, when you have four years of pre-med, for example, in the United States, I know a lot of people who do a lot of, a lot of, um, I'd say like biology or chemistry focused research or biochemistry focused research during that period of time. And then when they go into med school, they start working on clinical uh, clinical work because that is what they're exposed to. As a medical student in India, I personally have not been exposed to a lot of basic sciences research, right? So getting involved, if you want to get involved, I think cross cross collaboration with other disciplines. That is the way to go because not your physicians or not like most people around you or most people around me at least have not had any research training in the uh, pure sciences, right? And the problem with India is everybody works in their own bubble. It's you know it's okay if you're doing if you're doing basic sciences if you if you're doing research in biochemistry even though it has implications in clinical care. There is no cross collaboration. They're, they're not talking with physicians. They're just doing it on their own and working on their own. So I feel the first thing we need to do as not as medical students, but as physicians is to start encouraging cross collab cross collaborations between different disciplines. And if you are genuinely interested in um, basic research, basic sciences research, talk to PhDs who do research uh, in that particular field, because it's a, it's an ocean and you try and it's very, very broad. So uh, when you're talking about basics, it, it's even more broader than clinical research. So you need to talk to somebody who has, and you need to understand what you like because it's, otherwise you'll get lost, uh, in that. That is my view on, um, basic science research. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tarun? Yes. So basically, if we see in generally, we have most like with respect to this question, we can classify as a three types of researches. One is basic research, which is pure uh, bench side or lab research. One is translational research, which connects both basic research with clinical research. And third one is the clinical research. So most of us students or physicians mostly been involved in clinical research only. So basic sciences needs, as Dr. Sharon said, one is a good collaboration. Otherwise, you need a lab. Only premium institutes like AIMS or many central institutes have a good labs where students can do a good uh, basic science research. So if I compare uh, our college or any other colleges and I went to AIMS Delhi and I visited their labs, their uh, basic sciences labs, so you can do wonders in sleep physiology or neurophysiology or any biochemistry lab or anatomy lab. Like you can do a good studies, but thing is not present in all colleges. So that students may not show much interest in that. And another thing, students uh, like most of the students get exposure when they enter second year or third year, by which they will already pass reading the pre-clinical and paraclinical subjects and they mostly their mind perspective is towards clinical research and they, they want to do clinical research and they will give more preference to the clinical research and uh, even at that point of time they can plan a good translational research which, which combines both uh, uh, pre or para with uh, uh, clinical like biochemistry and medicine pathology and surgery so you can do a very good uh, interlink and you can uh, really do a good study, uh, but it depends upon the mentors or the teachers or the available facilities in their college. So that's from my side. Thank you. Um, okay, so for this question, actually, if we want to assess 
to answer it, I think we need to assist the perception of medical students on how they see basic science. Actually, uh, I was a medical student once and I remember that there was an underestimation of that the basic science and what, why we take even the, these courses in, at the middle school that we should be just focusing on the clinical aspect. And from the first year, we should go to the clinical aspect. So I think there's an underestimation and they, medical students, they don't perceive it as an important aspect to the scientific knowledge in the medical field. So we see them more going to the clinical uh, side or to work on a clinical or public health uh, research. And maybe uh, opportunities, what opportunities they get also, uh, we see them more rushed to, to do clinical research than um, um, things related to the basic science. And I remember from my uh, personal experience, when I, once I started uh, uh, my journey after my first year at med school 2016, I started at lab uh, research. I started molecular biology lab, neuroscience lab, at the animal unit, microbiology lab. And it really needs a lot of skills in using tools in the lab and the patients you have and patients you should have to learn things. And also uh, mentors actually demand us to have uh, a lot of skills, especially not just you need to know research and lab research and the transitional uh, uh, research that a lot of medical students don't know about it. Uh, and also that the time you have to dedicate to give to this, uh, you, you, you have to spend in the lab. And um, uh, as a medical student, you, you, your time, most of your time is your for, for studying uh, and preparing for exams. So um, I see that's why some students are just concerned going to the clinical aspect or going to do public health uh, uh, um, studies than lab research or basic science. Thank That's you. so interesting as uh, Dr. Shallah is explaining how as we progress through medical school, we kind of forget, overlook the importance of basic sciences. Honestly, nothing can be more true. Like even going through clinical rotations, you could kind of separate the like the average preceptors, those who just see patients during the day versus the preceptors who actually uh, stay informed on physiology and biochemistry as they're treating the patients. And you see how the teaching styles are very different between these two preceptors. And it's really, it's, it's very important to really, to stay up to date on basic sciences. And um, it's, it's only natural for, I guess, med medical students to engage in more uh, clinical research because we're seeing patients, right? It's, it's more accessible. We, we could do case reports, we could do um, different studies there. Uh, so it's just by the nature of our medical education and rotations that we have access to the patients. Um, but I think with experience and more publications and uh, as, as Sharon mentioned to, uh, to kind of network, it's even in the hospital, like go to the pathology lab and tr try to see what the samples that they that, that they've taken from the surgical departments and you know looking under a microscope just a step forward like that can really open up the door into preclinical research and it is as as dr shallah mentioned very very important <laughs> So, um, add on to that, um, what I would definitely like to say is, um, especially, I feel like the reason most medical students prefer to do research in clinical subjects is because, um, at least from like a US only perspective, we've always been told to like try to do research in like fields that we actually want to match in. So, I did most of my research in pediatrics because uh, it's something that I'm genuinely interested in, and I know that I'll end up like working in pediatrics in the future. So, that's where I started off like working in like, uh, you know, like writing case reports or like working on reviews on pediatrics because that is my field of interest and that is probably why most medical students tend to prefer clinical specialties as, as compared to basic sciences but um in argument to that i would also say that it, especially like most med schools your departments of public health of pharmacology of pathology they will honestly be way more active and way more like in like interested in research and actually be um, you know uh, publishing way more than the clinical departments because they do tend to actually work on research way more. So I feel like if you want to start off in research and in your like first or second year, 
if you're a first or second year oh. medical student and you're actually interested in like um you know uh, starting off and like learning on how to actually write a manuscript or how to draft uh you know a research paper i think working in basic sciences would definitely help you because uh that it, you in your first and second year you will be learning more of farm and fact and while clinical subjects might seem more interesting these are subjects that you're actually learning so it'll definitely be more useful for you if you're a young medical student and you're in your second year of med school just starting to take the steps or starting to like work on research it'll be really interesting to actually start off with basic sciences because there is a wide spectrum of possibilities there as well there are so many new drugs coming out in farm there are so many new developments especially with the covid there have been so many virology studies in micro so th- there is obviously like a lot of like uh, possibilities and a lot of like opportunities to actually do a really good basic science research i think that just needs to be like projected more to the med students from the departments of the uh, of like pat farm or micro themselves and involving more med students in their research projects would definitely help to bridge the gap between preclinical and clinical subjects thank you thank you all uh, we have completed like 3 out of 5 questions um just not to be monotonous let us all take a break for 5 minutes and uh, be back after the short break okay okay can i can i start uh tarun we are taking a 5 minute break so then we will move to questions okay okay fine fine no worries
This one, thank you, Bora. But for some reason, Bora, are you with me? I don't appear in the speaker uh, view. For some reason, I don't know. Uh, sorry? Um, uh, okay, okay. I got a screenshot for you, so I'll uh, just send it to you. Yeah. Great, great, great. Thank you. Guys, are we ready? Yeah, um, I think we can go ahead. Five minutes break was good. So now we get coming to the fourth question. Um, it is like, can medical students pursue an exclusive medical research career after graduating from medical school? I invite you to suggest organizations, fellowships, and degree programs like integrated MD, PhD, etc. that research-oriented medical students must know about and explore. Uh, yeah, so definitely. So after medical, after immediately after MBBS, we can directly join PhD in India after US. But I will more emphasize on Indian aspects and I will leave rest up to the other panelists. So coming to India after MBBS, you can directly join PhD and there are joint MD PhD courses also. So when coming to after MBBS, uh, directly joining PhD, ICMR has introduced the nurturing clinical science. Nurturing Clinical Scientist Program, where a person after MBBS can directly come up with a research proposal and they can directly apply and they will get a PhD in an ICMR Institute in any ICMR Institute across India. So I think every year around this June or July, they will open calls, I guess. Uh, one month back, I guess I have seen a notification again, call for Nurturing Clinical Scientist. So that's one. Uh, and there are, recently I have seen uh, some Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, something has initiated an MD PhD joint course where they are through through needs code they can directly join MD after MD they can continue their PhD it's an integrated course uh, I am not sure but some institutes are offering MD PhD joint MD PhD uh, uh, courses where they can directly pursue so it's up to them if they are comfortable with directly joining PhD after MBBS they can go. Uh, they will get a scientist position after they're completing their PhD. Or uh, if they want to have a additional edge like an MD degree, postgraduate degree, they can take an MD PhD. Uh, relatively, it's tough. It's little competition, like not more competitive, but it's tough to get. Uh, there are specific criteria for them. And even if you want to continue the research, you can do like as a medical student, we will collaborate and do. As a clinician, you can do a collaborative research. Uh, like research cannot be stopped even if you are not into an MD, PhD or MBBS, PhD. As a clinician, as a postgraduate, you can collaborate and do. As an academician, you can do. As a private doctor, you can uh, do publish case reports or do a small studies. And collaboration is the option which we can see. So you can do a good research through collaborations also. So that's from my side. Okay, thank you. So uh, I totally, yeah, I totally agree with what have Taron said, as you, you, you don't have just, uh, to go to get a PhD after getting your MD uh, to be exclusively working in medical research. You can be a clinician or a specialist in whatever field you are interested in and do your research, do a case report, uh, primary studies, systematic reviews, and so on. But absolutely, if you are considering a career as a physician scientist, after finishing your BMD, you can go and get a PhD degree in a research area or research topic you are interested in. If you are interested in cancer work, if you are interested in gynecology and uh, topics up there, you can uh, take a PhD uh, degree in, 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 in working in uh, a research idea in that area. 
And I would say also that uh, I know some colleagues that uh, they went towards get, taking a PhD and also get a specialty. Uh, so one of my colleagues, she uh, specializing in obstetrics and also doing a PhD in endometriosis. So you can have both, but you, you know, it takes a lot of um, dedication and commitment and time. Um, I, I will not consider any organizations or partnerships uh, and so on, because I each uh, person have their interest and upon that interest and upon the research um, area they want to work in, they choose uh, what organization or what uh, university they pursue. And I'll, I'll speak to uh, for those interested in practicing in the United States. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So with an MD degree, uh, you could uh, you could have an exclusive uh, career in medical research. I know uh, a lot of friends who engage in uh, what we call uh, clinical research associate. So they're involved with the clinical trials with major pharmaceutical companies, uh, many names that uh, I'm sure all, all of you will know. Uh, uh, it's it's not necessary, as Dr. Shallah mentioned, that especially in the United States, if you want to engage in uh, medical research to get a PhD degree, it's it's uh, absolutely not necessary. But it's a lot of people do do it. I myself, I, I completed a graduate program, healthcare administration. I'm currently in a doctorate, uh, doctor uh, doctoral degree program in healthcare administration as well. Um, but if you're going to do a PhD program or doctorate uh, study, uh, as uh, Sharon mentioned, make sure it's something you're passionate about. Uh, don't do, don't, I would not have advised to do something just for the sake of doing it or to fluff up your, your resume. Um, but as Dr. Ilham mentioned, it was, it was funny when, when he, he called uh, research an addiction. Uh, I, I, I was kind of remembering as I was preparing for my USMLE exam, there were times where I had this urge to look up an article on health policy and health, because that's really what my addiction was. Like I, I'm, I'm very passionate about health policy. So uh, when, and then that's why I engaged in a, a PhD program, right? So when I do that, I don't feel it as a burden. It's something I'm really passionate about. And at this point, I just have to figure out the design and the methodology of, of the study moving forward. So uh, make sure it's something you're passionate about. Um, and regarding residencies uh, in the United States, of course, that engage in medical research. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one helpful tool that everyone who wants to uh, apply for a residency in the United States, one very important tool that you should use is something called Residency Explorer. Uh, residency Explorer, it shares data with AAMC and ERAS and all the major platforms that that go through residencies uh, and it it kind of gives you an overview of the residency program and from there you'll kind of separate those residency programs that have clinical research as part of their program from those who do not uh, what you'll see is usually that um, the the, the residency programs that engage in research are those more affiliated with academic medical centers. Very rarely you'll find urban and, uh, you'll, I'm sorry, rural uh, residency programs engage in research. So make sure you look into Residency Explorer if you're interested in um, applying for residency in the United States. Okay, um, so to add on to what Dr. Nader has said, um, definitely do not like go into research after med school unless you're completely interested in it. It is, uh, I have seen a lot of like um, physicians who just graduated and since they want to get like some sort of like US experience, they enroll themselves in an MPH or in like a master's of biostats, but they don't end up completing it because by the time they actually like finish a year, they end up getting matched into residency. So don't really like enroll in some Something unless you're actually interested in it. And if you are, there are a couple of tracks, like there's a physician scientist track that I know about, which I think you, which helps you, um, you know, uh, do your master's in like public health, epidemiology, biostatistics. So you can definitely do that. The MD-PhD is also a good track 
to actually focus on research um, after finishing med school. Um, as, a, as for pediatrics, I do know that there is a track called uh, Pete's Genetics, which is a combined pediatrics and genetics program that also allows you to like specialize in genetics research and learning about genetics as well as pediatrics. It's a four-year program that is offered by some uh, universities. So you can definitely train in pediatrics as well, as but it also offers you the extra training in genetics and working as a, a you know in a clinical lab with genetics. So there are a lot of opportunities if you want to mix both um, clinical and research um, in in the same go. But definitely, uh, if you want to focus on pure research, MPH, MPH, and masters in biostats, masters in epidemiology, especially in good universities like Hopkins, like. Uh, Boston University. There are so many that are offering these, especially um, uh, I think like last fall, I, I think almost a lot of people enrolled in these uh, programs. And I do know that they do have really good curriculum. Some of them is virtual as well. So you don't really have to travel. You can actually attend it online. So if you're interested, these are really good options and they will definitely help you like propelling your research career ahead because after that you can definitely work with, as a doctor, you can also work with like pharmaceutical companies in like clinical trials. So there's a lot of job opportunities as working um, as a researcher after medicine. So definitely. Thank you. Dr. Sharon? Hi. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, so again, a lot of information has already been shared. You guys, uh, I think a lot of good insight has been given, especially I agree with Dr. Nadar a lot. If you do not like what you are doing, you will... Ultimate, this is, I think, something that Steve Jobs talked about, that if you don't like what you're doing, you will eventually end up giving up because it's too damn hard, right? But I'm going to talk to you about what you can do right now. As a medical student, you're sitting at home and you're viewing this uh, our conference. Right now, what you can do is you can get onto LinkedIn. LinkedIn, for some reason, has always been, uh, it's not, like, I've seen this happen. Like, everybody's on Instagram, but for some reason, nobody, like, very few people understand how, how powerful LinkedIn can be. And look, you're not going to land a residency program by reaching out to a program director on LinkedIn and saying that, oh, yeah, hi, I'm a medical student. I want, your, I want a residency. That's not going to happen. But you can reach out to people who are, who are doing something that you may think of, you know, pursuing. For example, if you think of pursuing an MD, PhD, isn't it better to talk to somebody who's actually doing an MD, PhD rather than, you know, look up YouTube videos and organizations that give you information bulletins? Just go on LinkedIn, search MD, PhD. You'll find a list of people. And I think Kavya uh, mentioned something about being afraid of rejection. There is no cure for that. You have to, like, the only way to sort of get over that is send 50 emails. You might get responses from five, positive responses from maybe one person. And to be honest, you have to use LinkedIn to sort of approach people. You, you will not, you can't approach people saying that, oh, I want to do research, help me. That's not going to work. Nobody has the time to do that. You have to approach people and ask them, okay, I'm interested in this. Can you tell me more about it? And if anything, is there a way I can provide value to you? If you start approaching people with that mindset of, okay, how can I help you? That will, that will I think, help you, help you reduce your rejection rate because nobody, like people, nobody is going to come up. Like, even if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, uh, can you give me a research paper? That's not going to work. Nobody has the time to go through that process with you. And, for, and it's just, it's not practical. So use LinkedIn, look at people's profiles who are doing MD, PhDs. If that's a, something that you're interested in, it's not just PhD. So there are certain clinicians that I know, um, a lot of famous cardiologists basically pub publish in great journals once a month. Right. You will never be able to, you, to talk to them on WhatsApp or on a phone call, but send them a LinkedIn message. Say hello. Uh, can we, you know, uh, can you answer a few questions? I, I'm telling you people will respond. But if you tell them that, hey, I'm a medical student in this country and I want to do a research paper with you, they're not going to look at your messages. So be practical. 
put yourself in their shoes and figure out what kind of value you can provide to them but reach out to them and talk to them that will tell you whether you actually want to do this or you just and and honestly if you're doing it to like bump up your cv or something you will not survive i will i guarantee you that it a phd is like a minimum 3 to 5 year commitment it's very long and it's very intensive so talk to people who are doing it figure out if that's what you actually like if you do great go go forward if you don't it's fine talk to people who that's that's actually good you're, you're preventing yourself from making a mistake so but use linkedin i think it's a very underrated tool and most people for some reason especially in the med- i know people in the engineering and the uh, finance community use it extensively so it's you know we can take a lesson from them uh, when it comes to networking because it it really does open up doors so yeah that's my uh, if if i may just uh, add for a few seconds on what what sharan has said thank you so much man i i totally agree and uh to <laughs> to somnath who who's afraid of rejection uh i'm very sorry if this sounds harsh if you are afraid of rejection the medical field is not for you no uh, it's <laughs> it is 100% rejection i actually uh just went unmatched uh for for this season and after soap week i literally went to residency programs around me getting rejected that's that's all i went to do i like i knocked on the door i've had the door slammed on my face program director is yelling at literally yelling at me i promise you yelling at me saying we're like we don't have any positions here what do you want from us you crazy guy so the only way to overcome fear of rejection is to get rejected multiple times and you'll you you won't be afraid to knock on that door and yeah, and and as uh, and as Sharon mentioned, uh, if if you're gonna approach some someone with an opportunity or you're searching for opportunity, do it professionally. Um, I can't tell you how many times I mentored or did not mentor many USMLE uh, students who come to me and say, uh, "I don't know, I don't know how to study for this." I say, "Okay, what have you done to prepare for this?" So let's let's see where where you are, where you're stuck, so I can help you. I swear to you, if they say I haven't done anything, I do not accept them as a client. I literally turn them there away there and, and they're paying me. They're paying me for their service, but I turn them away because there's no motive. There's, there's no, uh, there's no, there, no, there's no urge. Uh, I don't see a drive in them for to mentor them. And I've turned, I've turned away clients because of that. So if you have a properly packaged communication where you tell them, you know what, I've tried this, I've tried ABC and I need assistance in very specific things. People there on LinkedIn, as Sharon mentioned, people on LinkedIn will respond to you. I prom- they responded to me, and they will respond to you. Yeah, I think I don't know, like approaching yeah. people on LinkedIn. I feel like a lot of us, like I mean, when I started out, like building a LinkedIn profile, I was really worried on should I. Is it was like, oh, should I or shouldn't I approach people? Because I see a lot of people who are so accomplished, and I was like, should I even like ask them? But then, like, what's the harm? Like, you're approaching someone on, like, a professional platform. And if you want to ask someone and you want to ask a question about, like, um, about, like, something that they're doing, go ahead. Don't ever, like, hesitate because LinkedIn is meant for building connections. I see a lot of people on there hesitating on, like, how to approach. And there's no simple way about it. But it's just, like, shoot your shot, bite the bullet, and, like, message the person on LinkedIn and just send them a professional message saying, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm interested in this. And, and like Sharon said, it's more of, like, how can I help you if you're doing a research project? Could I be of value for that research project rather than, oh, can you help me? Because when it comes the other way around, a, a lot of the people on LinkedIn, everyone's so busy with their professional and personal lives that you they won't really have time to mentor every single person that they ask, that, who asks them. But if they are working on, like, a particular research, research that you like and then you offer them you're like okay so hey i'm some i'm actually working in like a similar setup here in india and i would love to like partner collaborate and i would like to like help you in your data collection that will actually make their lives easier and they would be more prone or more um open to mentoring you so that's a way to actually like go about it it's more of like if you see something that you're interested in try to like ask them if you can join in or help out because that is another way of like building connections that definitely will help you, um, you know, either match or like whatever it is, it, it connections do lo- last a long way. So that's like a really interesting way to go about it. 
I'll add a little bit to that. I think to answer Kavya's question, that how do you approach your own professors in your university, right? If you're going to go to your university professor and say, hey, uh, I'm a medical student, teach me how to do research and get me published in a journal. Nobody is going to, I don't care whether that person publishes 50 papers a month. He or she is not going to care. You have to do your, you have to do your background research thoroughly. You have to know exactly what you need from them. And then when you approach, so, so that when you approach them, they can see that you've already put in so much work, you're more likely to actually end up finishing it. Because most teachers and most mentors, including uh, I think pretty much all of us on board here, everybody has, has experienced uh, the over ambitious mentee that comes and is very excited to start working on something. And then two minutes and two days later, you, you, you can't find that person because they, they just never deliver. So put your work in before you approach. That's what's more important. And then again, ask for their guidance and they will help you. Everybody helps. It's not like nobody doesn't want to help. Everybody will help. You have to show um, conviction. I think that's more important. I just wanted to get, actually get your the panel's thoughts on this question. Um, uh, Sabir Farouk uh, asked a question. If you're getting a handful of opportunities, so you should opt for every opportunity that comes your way or select your projects. In addition, if you're choosing your projects, what should you be looking for in projects while selecting one over the other? Um, I, I think one, one thing that I've experienced, I'm sure uh, everyone else experienced as well, is when you kind of are engaged in different projects, you, and this is the, the beauty of networking, right? So when you show your projects to your network, other people want to join you and you have, you have newer projects. So this is, it's a good thing. Obviously you, you have, uh, this is kind of a sign of success that you're doing something right. Uh, I've actually struggled with balancing uh, different opportunities that come my way as well. So I actually want, wanted to ask uh, your thoughts, uh, on the, the panel, on how, how do you choose opportunities over another? How do you say no? And how do you, how do you choose those projects? I think so I do, like it's, you... an addiction. it's an addiction. So, I mean, of course, it's hard. I agree. <laughs> Go on. Sorry. It's definitely hard, but I feel like if, when you have a lot of projects, like if, so, if all of a sudden you have so much on your plate, it's definitely important to prioritize one of like what you're actually interested in and what is actually going to help you um, in your journey. So for example, if I was doing like five internal medicine projects and then a really good pediatric project came along and I hadn't started the internal medical medicine project yet I would definitely give that opportunity to someone else because I'll be up I'll be applying for pediatrics but that being said if you already started a project and another opportunity comes along it is unprofessional for you to just give up on the project and like uh and you know just move on to another one because that opportunity was better because not only are you letting everyone else down who were on the team with you but now they need to find someone else and train them to the same level that you were at so don't ever do that if you get multiple projects uh, at the same time and you have to choose definitely choose the one that that is uh, you know in line with your career goals but if you are already working on a project Make sure that you complete it and then move on because I know that you might find another opportunity more exciting, but it is very unprofessional in the medical field or any in, or in any field to leave a job half done and just move on because you weren't interested in it anymore. I've seen I've seen that happening um, a lot, especially with some of the mentees that we trade in auto. Sometimes they're sometimes the project takes too long and then they just stop answering and then they just stop working on the project. And it's it's not only is it unprofessional, but they're actually taking away the opportunity from someone else who could have actually done that job better and gotten it done. So yeah, that's one thing I wanted to put across. Also, if you're like starting out, <coughs> if you're starting out on research, like for a medical student, you're just starting out and there are a handful of opportunities in front of you, pick one get, and really put your heart into it because you know everybody's guilty of doing launching five projects at the same time and like a lot of people are guilty of you know and I've done that I've done that myself I have included involved myself in a lot of projects and then what would happen is I wouldn't you know you're too spread out and you don't end up doing a good job in any of them so if you're starting out, and you really you don't you know you 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 know you, it's like it's your first paper or your first two or three papers, and you're really just understanding the basics of it. 
my suggestion would be to work on one project at a time get and get them like finish the part that, that is assigned to you finish it off and then move on to the to the next project and then maybe once you once you start doing it once it becomes easy then you can start taking up multiple projects because you already know what needs to be done uh but start slow a foundation a strong foundation is far more important than having 10 very badly written papers which are half half published half of them are manuscripts it's not conducive to you or the teams that you're involved in so start slow and then it will happen people that's what people end up doing if you look at the publication histories of all these clinical physicians you'll see that they'll have like two papers published in the first 10 years of their career and then in the next 3 years they'll have 78 papers all of them amazing journals because it took them that long to understand the basics and the fundamentals right and then in a very short span of time with networking they were able to do a, a really good job but you have to give it that time you can't rush it and if you do rush it you won't go far definitely maybe i want to add a point on this question actually i would say that uh, if you are just starting out as a medical student and you're getting a lot of opportunities i would say that you are very very lucky because i remember when i started that nobody looked at me or nobody cared that much that i am willing to learn and i want to, to pursue a career in research who cares you know but uh, anyways uh, when you start and you got that opportunity the one at first opportunity to do the research by the time uh, you learn how to what, what is your priorities and uh, what is important and what is this important and also you sense things you begin to sense things and i remember when i was a student a lot of projects that we worked and and unfortunately we didn't get published but at least i get the experience that at this point i can say okay this project i would take it this project i will not so and absolutely as also sharon said that take it one by one Uh, and if you can do uh, multiple ones with each other, like I, I, I have done it uh, sometime uh, in, in my fifth year and my sixth year. Um, but choose the ones that you really uh, believe that they would be published or at least that they are, you are working with a, a really good group or really you are having a good, really good mentor that would work on publishing it. Because believe me, you don't want just to waste your time. I know you will, get a lot of research experience and there's no need i believe that all the way you learn but if you want to do multiples make sure that you are choosing the one that they would really get published uh that's what i want to say i'm sorry i just couldn't hold back i also want to add one point like i completely agree when duha says where is the experience from where i come um it was like beggars can't be choosers so i was taking anything that was being thrown to me any kind of research uh, experience i was able to get i was going and doing it just and i think some of them might have been um, questionable in their research ethics also so i was learning research ethics as well but not on the site through the internet so just be um, as i think most of the panelists said get your knowledge first and get correct knowledge first from the internet or from good resources and then jump into the practical aspect of research and do whatever you're given and of course if you have many opportunities then you choose and then best of luck for the future please continue sorry uh, thank you um so i think we have already moved on to the audience questions uh we have one more question from the team that's left and it might be similar to the previous question about uh, pursuing a clinical career with research so the question is what are the future prospects for those who want to pursue research as clinicians could you provide tips and guidance for pursuing career as academic clinicians or physician scientists it's like we already know what the life of a clinician will be but um the um life of an academic clinician or a physician scientist it is not known whenever we come across a twitter a uh, linkedin we see some post who have like md phd's or pursuing md phd's they say it took like 10 10 years to get what it is being done now and uh, some uh, physicians quitting their uh, 
research career in the mid and moving on to uh, become a clinician again. So uh, there is always a setback like, uh, can it be done? Can we be a physician scientist? Is it possible? Um, is it valuable the time spent pursuing career as a physician scientist? So please provide tips and guidance. So um, I think, yes, that's definitely possible. I have seen a lot of physician tra scientist tracks, uh, job opportunities, as well as like a lot of people, like you said, on LinkedIn pursuing the same. So I do know that it's definitely possible. The, the question is, would you rather be a clinician who is doing research as a part, like on the side, or would you rather be a clinic clinician hyphen researcher because those are two different um you know terms like every clinician if you're working in like a university hospital or a university setting you will be involved in research in some or the other way even if i was just like a practicing physician or an attending physician in a university i would still be involved in some or the other form of research and if that is good enough for me and that fits in with my goals that's well and good so do remember that if you pursue um a residency and if you're doing a fellowship, it doesn't mean that it's the end to your research career. You can always perform or you can always work on research while you're practicing as a clinician. But however, if you want to work on research mainly as well as practice as a physician, so there is the MD-PhD and the physician scientist track, which I, like I said, I do know that it focuses more on epidemiology, biostatistics, public health. So that's another good option. You could also do an MPH along with alongside your MD and then start your residency so that you're more well versed with that. But uh, like I said, um, there's another um important like uh like there's something that I've been seeing uh coming up uh, recently are like these new tracks of programs, categorical programs. Like I mentioned, one of them was the PEDS genetics, like the combined pediatric genetic track, which I think no one has really heard about. It's something that I saw on Residency Explorer when I was looking up pediatric programs, and I was really interested that there was a program that had like two years of genetic research as well as two years of pediatrics. And I think if you look more, there are like programs that you can find which can combine both medicine and research as well. So um, as Dr. Nadar said, there's a lot of information on Residency Explorer. So if you just like start looking up programs, looking up the tracks of the categorical programs, you might actually find some that do have research integrated. So like it really depends on what you want of uh, like how much of research you want to in incorporate in a clinical career. Don't forget that even if you're working as a clinician, you can still be working in research as well. Like even if you're working full-time as an academic uh, attending physician, you can still be involved in research. So there's no like, there's no like one way or the other. You can always combine both. I think uh, the, the word prospects is it's, it's actually an interesting word because just because of the changing reality of, of the world and especially in healthcare, right? Um, I don't know if, if we were to ask uh, what are the pro like 20 years ago, if we were to ask what are the prospects for to become an, like an academic uh, uh, medical professor and like in a medical school, um, you, you would say, oh, it's very difficult. There's politics involved in academic medicine, at least in the United States. I'm not sure about other countries. Uh, and uh, I, I would guarantee these will be the majority answers that you would hear 20 years ago. Like if I want to get into academic medicine, it's hard. It's almost impossible to get tenure. You'll be working for years without any uh, any real appointments, all of which, which have been would have been true. And it's actually probably true today as well. But what happened in the last 20 years, right? You had you had this explosion in the digital era. So like the most successful and biggest instructors in medicine today are not Harvard professors. They're not Stanford professors. There are Dr. Hossein Sattar of Pathoma. There are Dr. Fisher of Kaplan, um, uh, Dr. Najib uh, in, in India. So th these are the leaders of medical education today, those who went and created their own platforms away from this establishment. Uh, this is why I think it's very difficult to say, what are the prospects of the future? Well, the prospects depends on the creators on the ground, right? So my point is, if, if, if you should create your own prospects. So solve the problems that you feel need to be solved. This, pl this panel is a, a big demonstration, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Khudada uh, mentioned the, the partnerships that you make throughout, uh, throughout your network. And those partnerships just multiply. This is something that 
it's very difficult to explain unless you've gone through it. The, the partnerships that you make and the little projects that you engage in just multiply with time. So the, the main thing is to find a strong team to work with. And you'll see that you, you'll create your own prospects. So, and as a clinical researcher. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, yes. So, when coming to the Indian perspective, so even I am aspiring to become a physician scientist in future. So, I have a doubt in my mind like, what is a physician scientist? So, I am really confused. So, because it's physician scientist. So, if you do an MD degree and if you do research, then you term yourself as a physician scientist, or you should work in lab, or you should work in a central institute uh, to be in a scientist position to be called as a physician scientist so sorry so so when i went to csa or igib so i met two physician scientists from india one is dr vinos karia one is dr anurag agarwal so i asked the same question to them they said like anybody can be called as a physician scientist even if you've done an mbbs and you are doing a research at your institution you are a physician scientist you have done an uh, md and you have doing a good research at your institution, uh, you are a physician scientist. So there is not specific term that you should do PhD or you should do a scientist position in an institute to be called as physician scientist. So it is what they told me. So I'm reciprocating, I am reciprocating the same. So when it comes to an academic clinicians, like uh, it's nothing to be done with anything uh, research. So it's if you have done MD and if you have gone if you are doing as a professor in colleges, then you can call yourself as an academic clinician. So, and coming to the future prospects, so I think most other panelists have covered. So I will pass to the next one. Um, okay. Actually, I don't have that much to add, especially about what uh, Dr. Nader have said that you should have your own perspective uh, perspectives for the future. And I want to say also that um, if you are choosing a, a career path to be a physician scientist or academic clinician, it's not about the title. And I am talking about my uh, uh, personal experience that I'm really not involved or choosing to be involved in research because I am searching for a title or I'm searching for to get specialty and so on because I want to do it. And that's really a a really important aspect that we should consider if you really want to do research and because we know that research for it's not for uh, anyone and we know that uh, through the our initiatives that we have try with the students and the work with the students that we have seen uh, so uh, I would uh, always believe that if ask yourself that question that if you're really mm -hmm. pursuing this as a career uh, and uh, you want to pursue this uh, as a future for you. Um, and I wanna just comment about what uh, Darren have said that, uh, yes, I heard some perspectives about that you can be called a physician scientist without getting a PhD degree. Some people say that, uh, yes, you can go to the title without doing it, but I don't know if, um, if it's acceptable worldwide or not, actually. Um, so yeah, that's all. Dr. Yeah, so I, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Um, a lot of people, like everybody here has talked about like the pros of becoming a physician scientist and everything, but there are a lot of sacrifices that go into becoming a physician scientist as well. So it's very, that's why I say, you know, you need to talk to people in the field because they will tell you the ground reality of what it is like to work as a physician scientist, right? And the other thing is research is very broad. It's not like, you know, you can you can do only systematic reviews. You can do only like, like how Nadar is doing. He's doing just health policy, right? Um, you can, you need to focus on what you want to do and how you want to go about doing it. Teaching is also a very big part of an academic physician's life. So do you enjoy teaching? Is that something that you want to prioritize? Do you want to do, do you not, and if some people don't, some people don't like teaching. So what they end up doing is they just do research and see patients. So 
my perspective on this would be i don't think i'm qualified to give you advice on whether it is nice to be an md phd or or not but i think it's it's more important that you reach out to the people in the ways that we have dem- you know we've talked about talk to them and try to fi- try to get a feel of what is their day to day like because that will really tell you whether that's something that you want to emulate is that a life that you want to live and then decide on you know because physician scientist sounds really aspirational like oh my god i'm i'm changing the world with my science and I'm, you know i'm treating patients and everything but really try to understand what you're actually going to be doing i think that is very important and it's important that you guided well uh, and you you have you, you know what you're getting into because it's it's not all roses there are there's a lot of sacrifice also and um it's difficult there's a lot of frustration and as dr nadha has said there's a lot of rejection i mean it's just unbelievable the amount of rejection research brings with it so are you prepared to you know do you have that kind of a personality that you're going to you know go through with it so consider all of these things before um getting you know getting into a long term commitment like a phd or a you know doing something on in that regard that's what i'd like to say thank you so now we have completed the questions from the team and we can again move to questions from the audience um i think dr kavya can read out a few selected questions for us dr kavya uh, dr sukanya so gane yeah. hello actually hello. Uh, i would like to add some points related to question 2 and question 5 the panel discussion Please. everyone yeah actually everyone come up with their rigorous solid doctor mind and start discussing about the professional world what will you will face in the medical profession how will you deal with it you have to face the rejection you have to be solid with that field but let me tell you one thing from the starting from the emotep the one who gets the containment to the latest surgery of the robotic that we are recently using now what we have faced what we have see is the courage of the people to ask themselves the question why and the answer of the question of research is why the research starts with why the scientific validity which is the key necessity of the ethical issue that we are we discussing in the clinical research to undergo and practice those clinical trials to approve the trial of any treatment or intervention that we can approach to the clinical treatment and clinical practice to cure the patients so first i just would like to just go with the basic mnemonics of the things that people will understand it very basically we have to just follow the scientific validity and the observation of the testing with hypothesis experimentation and with the theory after just applying it so research is why first you need to ask your question why you need to go with this research then you will just find the key points of that research and start researching and searching about the topics that you like to add it for example that if we just come if, if a patient comes to a hospital walks down to a corridor he has he has pain in in his abdomen and start complaining no i have acidic reflux how can you say that i have abdomen pain because of because of stones or any other issues because we do the diagnosis we go through the molecular level and the other level of organizations and to discuss and to seek out the real cause of that patient so this is what is medicine is medicine is all about research we don't know anything unless until we diagnose unless until we think what is the real cause behind it so this is what is research is we have to ask our question why we have to just do the search we have to accumulate the data we have accumulate the information that we have to analyze and observe observe every possibilities into it when you just start writing a review article then you choose one topic suppose i have choose renal cell carcinoma then i start accumulating the information related to renal cell carcinoma and then i start elaborating the recent points to the evolutionary level starting from the beginning to the recent most recent one then then, then there is a curiosity inside me that penetrates the interest of me to do something so i just want to ask ask everyone that you should listen to your heart in that particular field 
because everyone talks about their professional level you just face you can't do it you can't make it but once you will make your mind you will start going through the process of asking the simple questions why you start searching for that topic you start working for it and you just follow the basic scientific manuscript writing procedure you will make it and there are certainties related to the cause of the things that we will face in the professional world but that's the part of the life because we have face in every profession thank you very much thank you so much thank you um uh, dr kavya can we move to the audience questions please yeah sure Uh, you can read out the first question you like yeah yeah okay. here goes the first question like uh, is there any suggestion on how to start uh, research for ug students with no idea of research um i think that's pretty much like what we uh, discussed like throughout i think it's more of like uh first of all approaching finding a good mentor and like we have basically like outlined as to how to find a good mentor secondly there are so many courses available on coursera on um uh, web of science and on uh like i said the nih course which was free so start working on that and the best way is to is to just get hands on like take any opportunity that you find it might be in basic science it might be in clinical science anywhere get a head start start working on it you might make a lot of mistakes and you might feel super lost at times but that's the best way to learn there's no other way about it i think um, i'll add to that uh i have spent a considerable amount of time trying to find the perfect research course and the perfect research book and the perfect research paper that will teach me everything that i need to know about research and i will tell you it does not exist do not waste your time instead you know whenever you whenever you like for example if avantika said the coursera courses right you have to walk into that coursera course thinking that you might only get 10 or 15% value from this course even though they are telling you that in 7 hours they'll teach you everything there is there to to know about research you might only walk away with 2 minutes of content from there but those that is how you will learn so my way of approaching um or rather upgrading myself and you know it's very important it's not like you know all of us here are uh, nobel nobel win prize winning scientists and we're sitting with like this our whole life all we've been doing is research it's not like that we're all learning and we're all on this journey together so my way of approaching this is you know you you have to read you have to read research papers there's a there's something there's a there's something in poetry it's called you have to read a thousand poems before you write a prose so when you take when you carry that over to research i would suggest that you start reading papers on topics that you like i like i like to read about neurology for instance and i'll read neurology papers and i won't understand the biostatistics and all the graphs and all of the complicated you know uh terms and phrases they use but the best thing that you can do is just google it you don't have to understand the entire paper uh by going to some course or something you can just start try and understand everything about that one paper it might take you an entire month right but it's like if you do that exercise you will learn so much that the next time when you when you get go, you know when you start reading a paper when you start reading a second paper for example what will happen is you will end up knowing 80% of what or 50% of everything that's on the paper and you you still not know the other 50% and you repeat that process until you come to a point that 70 to 80% of everything that's out there you you realize that okay all of this is more or less the same it's the same concepts it's the same things just presented differently right and i think that way of gathering information and uh, it's it's a bit I, i wrote on the chat it's like programming you know if you whenever you hear programs or even a little bit python r you ask any programmer they'll tell you the, the only thing that they're good at is googling 
that's how they learn how to program that's how you you talk to any programmer that's what they'll tell you yeah we, there's no course out there there's no a uh, 20 minute lecture or book that's published everybody everybody's trying to get there that's the aspiration with which all of us are trying to you know teach and educate everyone but it truly does not exist you have to learn piece by piece block by block and if you do that i promise you you will in a very short period of time you will get much like you get much more bang for your buck buck being time and effort here So that's my uh, take on it. Okay, And just to add on, oh, please go okay. ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, maybe I want to add. <laughs> okay, so maybe I want to add something uh, about what Sharon said. That uh, I remember myself when I was my in, in my fourth year. Absolutely, I used to go through all the online resources that we have: uh, courses, box. notebox and so on but uh, also get yourself involved in any journal club you hear about in the hospital you go to or any discussion among research you hear or even conferences and i remember myself i when i was fourth year medical student i used to go to journal clubs that internal medicine um, residents used to do and even though i i remember myself 90% first time i entered this journal their journal club 90% of what they have said i didn't get but i went home and i i read about it and then i went to their another journal club and so on and even though if you hear about conferences if you heard about any meetings that they are open uh to students or open to uh strangers and uh, they and uh, with the willing to learn just go and listen and then go and read as sharon said don't underestimate uh, the power of such thing that getting familiar to the concepts and hearing people discussing and how they discuss and they have approach uh, um uh, research and learn um the, the critical appraisal thing that you, you read an article so what what about reading an article how i read an article how i an- analyze it and just don't focus that i want to do research also focus that i am a um a, a practitioner in the future and i want to give my patient the best care ever which is it, it it's going to be an evidence based one so absolutely you have to learn these skills even though if you don't don't want to do research from a to z that's why i wanted to add sorry nader oh no problem. <laughs> come on please do thank you so much and uh just to add a little more to what sharan and dr shalla mentioned um not only does one comprehensive book on medical research not exist it actually cannot exist right I, m- most of medical research is uh yeah it is the design and principles but a lot of it is just intuition and the only way so if a book exists on medical research then there's no there's no point of going through uh clinical science and medicine right it will just be basic sciences throughout the, that's why we have clinical medicine to have hands on experience so um i i would suggest honestly even just getting a case report under your belt even if it's not even an unusual case even just a regular hypertension case just, just someone coming in with hypertension just just write it out of practice just l- learning how to go through the steps of writing a case report and present and just having that manuscript ready and just present it to your preceptor and see what they say just to have that uh just to have that experience even if it doesn't lead to a publication just to have that first step and once you do that you start becoming more and more comfortable with the principles of research thank you thank you for the valuable okay, insights two, two things two things number one it, it's an addiction right so it, it it's okay if it's an, if you're addicted to it you're going to do it uh, it's it's not a problem and the second thing is like you know another said it's uh, there's a lot of rejection involved you you read 50 books and you'll find one chapter and you you know you you scratch your head you're like why am i wasting so much time doing all of these you know going through all this unnecessary uh, information and i'm not learning anything but honestly that's how that's how you work that's how it works and there is really if you find a shortcut please share it with us because I think we've been we've spent a lot of time going around in circles. So yeah. 
But treat it like an addiction. I'm telling you, it'll it'll make things very easy if you treat it like an addiction. So, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Kavya. Can we move to the next question? Yeah, like, uh, would you suggest a research elective, and uh, could you please share some information on on how IMG can participate in such programs? Um, I think uh, Harvard does offer research electives and so does Hopkins, but you'll need to find them on the website. Some of they all have their own particular requirements. Some of them need like a, a TOEFL score. Some of them need you to have your step one completed. And keep in mind, these are just research electives. They won't be clinical electives. So there is a difference between both of them. But definitely, I think the best way is to like look up the university websites. Uh, most major universities do offer research electives. Some are research electives to um, clinical um, to students in their second and third year of med school. If I'm not if I'm not wrong, so that's one way of look, going about it. Definitely, there there might be like it'll definitely be expensive. That's one that's one thing I can say. Research electives are not cheap, and it is also you'll have to like fund your own travel, fund your own stay. And there is no guarantee that you will be pub you'll get a publication in that one month. It's more about you just learning as to like how research works in that lab, in the lab that you're actually rotating in, and just learning the just like how like how the how they go about it in their everyday life. But you're not really going to be working hands on and getting something published. So do make sure to like not have that expectation because I know people who do good research electives for a month and they're very upset that they never had like a publication out of it. So that's really not possible, but definitely research elective is a good way for you to learn as to how research works in the United States. And that being said, uh, if not a research elective, there are definitely research opportunities. Uh, Mayo provides a lot of them. Uh, you can look them up on the website on mayo.edu. They do have like a lot of research positions available as research assistants or as research um, clinical research associates. So you can definitely apply for those. Uh, some of them sponsor visas as well. So those are like more like long term positions where it's like more of uh, six months or a year where you will be working under one physician on like one particular project. So you definitely do have a better chance of getting published there as well as, uh, you know, having a good one on one um a relationship or a mentor uh, a mentor that's actually going to help you with your career because you will be working with them for a longer period of time so if you're actually looking forward to do to actually working hands on in research i would recommend you know going for a research position in any of the any in mayo in cleveland in any place that offers it because that's a longer uh, prospect and i mean that's a long term prospect definitely but it's going to help you in in your residency application or definitely in like just like helping you learn more about research and publishing, I think that's a better way to go about it. I think I'll add to that a little bit that, you know, um, a research elective is like a trailer to a movie. You will only taste, you, you will only get a very, very brief taste of what goes on. Um, one of my very close friends, she actually did a, a research elective in Boston, uh, in Mass General in Boston. And I was just talking to her, you know, what was her experience like? And I can share that with you guys, that what essentially ended up happening is she was working as a, you know, as medical students work in research. You, you know, you, you collect data, you write manuscripts, you do a little bit of statistical analysis, but so it's not something that you can't get from your own med school, but if, when you're doing it in a big name, big name hospital, you get a platform there. You know, they, they'll have their own biostats departments. They'll have their own manuscript drafting departments. They'll have their librarians who can help you, um, you know, figure out a good way of looking for literature. Those are concepts that you will not be exposed to normally. You, you have to go to a higher institution and work with them for a bit to get an experience of it. So... In my in my, like in my opinion, a research elective is great if you can afford it. Number one and number two, if you have the time for it. Um, but don't walk into the research elective thinking that oh, I'm going to be working for a month. I'll be getting four publications from a Harvard professor because I did a one month internship with him. That's not that is not how it works. You know, you you're going there to it's it's the same as 
doing an internship is not good. you know doing a clinical clerkship in a in a us med school does not guarantee you a residency it just you've just you know exposed yourself to that system that's it right and sure if you enjoy it and you know you do good work and your professor likes you you can probably continue that relationship in the future that's always there but if you're only going for a month it's a bit difficult to publish in like one month but as avantika said most you know most of these uh, hospitals have six month one year positions they're longer much higher chances of getting published but again there is no guarantee so all again rejection is there so you know you have to keep that in mind thank you anyone would like to add anything can we move to the next question dr kavya can we have the next question yeah like uh, can you tell strategies for medical student to uh, focus on basic concepts in order to produce a paper of high scientific uh, significance okay your first paper is not going to be published in nature get that straight you are not you, you know your first paper you are already rejecting everyone sharan come on <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be realistic. You are not going to publish in the high in in the Lancet. You know, when you say high significance, I'm assuming papers that will get cited and you know uh, that are really of a really good value. You will get there eventually. It takes a lifetime to you know to get published in a journal like Nature or you know even a, you, you look at like I said, go through LinkedIn. there are practicing cardiologists who have been working in research for 10 years and when they publish in in nature or in the lancet it's like the proudest moment of their academic careers all of us here are medical students who have not even done residency right so first understand what you're trying to you know where what you're trying to aim at and second like i said find good mentors if you can like you might be able to work with with that cardiologist who are, like you know or that uh, physician or somebody who who is willing to mentor you work with people who are doing really good work and you will eventually pick up good practices from them but please don't assume that the first and only paper the first paper you work on is going to be cited and you're going to make the news and all of that happens after a lifetime of effort so just keep your expectations in check at all because this is something that you know i have i have encountered a lot you know medical students are just so we're all over ambitious type a personalities who want to you know win the world but we don't sometimes we we lose you know we lose sight of what's actually how much effort it takes to get there so um we do we really do need to you know scale down focus on your foundation focus on the good practices that you can pick up from these people and your the quality of your of your work will eventually improve um and what you can avoid is don't work on a lot of papers at the same time thinking that oh maybe one of these shots will hit don't don't approach it don't don't go into it with a, like an american ak47 mentality go in with a with a sniper mentality one shot but it's good you know one one hit kills that's what you want to focus on and that's how you will i guess grow So yeah, definitely. And and, the, oh, yeah, please, go ahead. Please. Sorry. No, no, please. Okay, okay. So I just want to add on to what Sharon said about like high impact factor journals. Uh, I've seen like a lot of people asking us like, how do we publish in like an impact factor of ten, impact factor of fifteen? The reason is, uh, they feel that the the higher the impact factor of the journal is, they feel like it's more. I mean, their research is going to be viewed by so many people. But I can say this uh, as like as from personal experience that I have published in journals with like an impact factor of one or two, and those researchers have been have been viewed by three million people. They've been cited by almost five or six papers. So even though the impact factor of the journal was pretty low. it still ended up getting cited it still ended up getting picked up i think one of our papers also got featured in a newspaper uh in toronto so in these were not published in like the lancet or like nature they were published in a normal 
uh, you know, PubMed index journal. So it doesn't really matter as to like how significant the impact factor of the journal is. It really depends on how good your research is. Because if your research is good, it is eventually going to get picked up. That's one thing. The second thing is definitely what I wanted to add on is about um, like, as the question said, how do you produce a paper of high scientific significance? Make, like if you if you want to choose a topic that is actually like you know ongoing for example if you pick covid or if you pick a topic that is evolving right you there there might be a chance where uh, if like if i did a, a, a research on covid in 2019 my research might not mean anything as of now in 2021 or 2022 where um you know there's vaccines covid has evolved there are so many strains so at that time the treatment protocols that existed does not exist now so there's like different ways different modalities of like treating patients the the drugs that were you know once used is no longer being used so if if you want to work on something that's constantly or fast evolving because you think that okay it's it's faster to get published but in the long run it might not really work out well for you because your paper might not end up getting cited or uh, because it it might just be like obscure after two three years. So if you're working on like a topic like for example like hypertension or diabetes, these are long-standing chronic clinical conditions, and they're always focused on newer drugs, newer treatment regimens. Work on these so that these are something that's definitely going to get picked up by um you know uh, by people reading it, and you have a higher chance of being cited because if you if you like talk about like a different way of managing or like you know, combining two or three treatments and having like a drug trial that worked and drug trial that didn't and comparing both of them, that's actually something that'll get picked up because no one's ever going to run out of patients who have diabetes or hypertension. So the topic that you work on definitely matters. And I and like, personally, like I'm an editor, uh, associate editor at one of the journals at Springer Nature. And I see hundreds of papers every day getting rejected. And these papers have been written so well, but the problem is the journal has like only a 5% acceptance rate or a 3% acceptance rate. And they can't, they simply cannot afford to publish every single paper. So getting rejected does not mean that your paper was not good. It just means that the journal did not have space or the journal wasn't able to publish it because of high volume of uh, papers being submitted that month. So do not lose faith if, if, you, if your paper gets rejected from journals, it's not personal. It doesn't mean that your research is worthless. It just means that you had bad luck and there were a lot of submissions and it you couldn't get through. So keep trying, keep trying to publish and you will eventually get find a journal that will publish you. Uh, so as long as your research is good, you don't really have to worry about getting published. It will take its time, but it will happen. So that's what I wanted to put across. Go ahead, Dr. Nader. Yeah, yeah. So just uh, building on what honestly what Avitka and uh, Sharon said, uh, it's. I think going through medicine, we we have to always keep our expectations and mindset in check, uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fear of rejection that that we talked about a lot. Um, once you go through so many rejections, you're just you're just you just become immune to it, right? So you just keep submitting. Obviously, like. I haven't, I've never met the panel, but I could already see how much rejections that we could, we could just turn this whole <laughs> discussion on just all the rejections that we went through, honestly, oh, like I'm hundred percent sure. So, so just, just get used to it. Uh, I know that sounds hard. Get used to rejection. Uh, it's not going to work out the first time. We're not going like, to, you're not going to publish, uh, like Sharon mentioned, you're not going to publish in the Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine. And that shouldn't be your goal. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's the purpose of research. The purpose of research is to shed light on the innovations in medicine or new issues that we have. Um, and I don't know, th there's some politics involved in, in, in journals. Uh, no, no offense to anyone, honestly, but we've seen, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers, but it was very early on in the pandemic where there was the whole controversy on hydroxychloroquine there were studies published in the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was a disgrace. After a month, those articles were uh, retracted. So the goal is not to publish in these journals. The, the goal is to publish good research, sound research with good design, with uh, accurate data, and, and, and an honest, uh, objective view on the issues that you're talking about. So... Uh, I think it's just a, mind sh a, a mindset shift that we, we should have. Focus on good research and obviously what you're passionate about and s try to stay away from politics, please. Maybe I want to add one point 
to what my colleagues have said. And I agree totally with what they have said. And they are speaking from experience of a lot being a lot rejected. But for a medical student, don't just go towards, I want to publish in a high uh, impact journal and so on. Focus on the journey and the learning process that you are in. Focus on the experience you are getting right now. And believe that you are always put this uh, in front of your eyes, that you are an expert, not an expert yet, but you are an expert in progress and believe that you will uh, eventually get the chance to publish in one of these journals that you will always dreamed of. And it will it will come to you, this opportunity, but step by step, and you have to be patient. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. I think we'll take one more question from the audience and then in our panel discussion. Dr. Kavya, we have any more questions? Yeah, like last one question. It's yeah. like one of our participant is asking, like I'm very uh, I'm very interested in oncology research. Can you please suggest any program uh, that would support me with this and how can I approach my professor out of the university? I think we've like covered most of it, haven't we? Like the approach and the um i think most of the most of the answers have already been covered in the discussion i guess um but to add on to it to like just go honestly google like you will find opportunities google linkedin all of these different uh, you know those are tools that are available to you like if you know if there's one name that pops up in your head about oncology research it's md anderson in houston like that is like the the mecca of oncology research. Just hit up people who work there. Tell, talk to them about your passion. Talk to them about okay, yeah, this is I love oncology. And why do you love oncology? Write a letter of intent if you have to. And you know, but you have to like you have to mail five hundred people, and you have to do that over the course of a month. And in the offshoot that one of them is, you know, having tea and they see the email and they, they happen to look, glance at your email, they look it up and then they might reply to you. So the you have to keep that in mind. But other than that, talk to people. It doesn't have to be MD Anderson. It can be some, it can be a very big oncologist who does research in your, you know, that would honestly be better if you work with someone locally and have some work done. It's easier to approach somebody you don't know because uh, your credibility is spoken for by the work you've done. Otherwise, it's very difficult to you know assess whether you'll actually do what you're saying. So my opinion would be to find somebody who does good oncology research locally, talk to them, work with them for a year, two years, whatever, get some publications, get some experience, then move your way up gradually. But it will take time is all I'm saying. And if I may suggest something, um, it, it might sound a little silly, um, but, but I think uh, one way to show your passion, especially in this uh, digital age we have, is start a blog. I mean, you, you could start, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to like write your, a medical art, uh, a journal article on your blog. There's so many amazing research studies that are published that are kind of going under the radar. Uh, br bring some of them to the spotlight in your blog. Talk about talk about that on your blog, and when you do that, and you reach out reach out to uh, researchers at MD Anderson at Mayo or Cleveland Clinic, you'll come out from a position of strength. You know, the, they'll look you up. They'll see, wow, this person is active. They're very passionate in this field. You could even uh, maybe give a shout out to them, interview them uh, on 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 your platform as as a blog. And that, that'll open up doors for you to research uh, under, under different people. When you come that you come for, when you come like that, you come from a position of strength. And starting a blog is so inexpensive today. And it's very, very easy. There's so many platforms. Like I, I started MedFox Academy. I did A through Z design there. And I knew nothing about web design. And I'm sure a, a lot of our panelists did, did the same thing in their, in, in their own platforms. You'll learn how to do these things as you go. So uh, it's very easy. It takes nothing. And it's, it, in my opinion, it's very effective. And uh, the ma main thing is consistency, writing blogs all the time and talking about issues that you really care about. 
And then I think that'll help you shine when you reach out to other people asking for a research opportunity. I think adding oh, on sure. about cold emailing, like Sharon mentioned about just like emailing professors through their university um, email IDs, you know, you can email like thousand uh, people and get like one response, that the, but that one response is good enough. But the one thing that I want to like um, add on as to how you want to actually start emailing is like make sure that the email is personalized. Don't have like a template and just copy paste it and then just like BCC and add everyone on that because that's stupid. That shows zero effort and it's very likely that the professor who's reading it will know that you just send that to multiple people. Don't be like, oh, I'm interested in research, blah, blah, blah. So can I work with you? That makes no sense. If you generally, I know it's going to take more time, but like a, a, a really good approach to this is actually look up the research that they're working on currently and then write a few words or a few sentences about that research. Be like, I saw that you were working on XYZ this actually appealed to my interest and this is why i'm approaching you for a research position it might seem like a lot of hard work doing this for 100 or 200 emails but this having a more personalized approach it will definitely help you you know reaching out to the professors better and it'll it'll definitely ensure that they actually take interest and read your email if it's way more personalized so i think like personalizing cold emailing that's another you know um you know way of actually making sure uh trying to get the word out that you're looking for a research position. Maybe I want to add one point uh, on what Dr. Nader said about the blog thing. I really used to do this uh, when I was at medical school that uh, we used to do two things, writing evidence-based pieces that we spread it to the public. So I, from this experience, I learned how to search the literature, where to search, how to get the best uh, evidence and how to formulate it in a way that public people can get the medical information and that helped me a lot as a researcher and also there's the term right now we have as medical journalism but you can write also about topics that interest you and interest your community and being, uh, writing an evidence-based thesis so uh, yes i really uh, recommend doing such thing to, to add to that if you if you've been listening to the whole conversation this is a lot of effort Right, there is a lot of effort involved. So, if you're doing this to say, okay, oh, you want to be, you want to get into uh, an internal medicine residency and then do an oncology fellowship, and you're doing it just to get into residency or just to get into a fellowship, you won't be able to persevere all the way through. Because, but if you genuinely enjoy it, you will enjoy the journey and the challenges that come with it. So. Like, figure out why you do it. Like, you know how we say that, why do we do research? You know, you have to, or rather ask for, ask why when you start research. I'm telling you, ask why before you begin your research also. Why are you doing this? Because it's, otherwise it's just too much effort. So if you're genuinely interested, this is honestly a really good way uh, that's been outlined, but it will take a lot of effort and a lot of hard work on your part as well. So. Uh, keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kavya. So I think it's time to end our panel discussion for today. I think we can keep talking about this topic for long, even. So I personally feel it was very much informative and inspirational to hear experiences and thoughts from our valuable panelists. And I can almost resonate with whatever was shared. And I'm sure when working as a team with more collaborations between various researchers across various health sciences, a lot of valuable and remarkable changes can be brought to practice. And I hope our audience and team had the same experience with our panel discussion today. And I thank all our panelists and team members and our audience for um, traveling through all this time. Thank you for having me as the moderator for this wonderful event. And uh, I think I'll hand over to Lalita. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Suganya. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Suganya. 
Now I would like to announce that tomorrow, that is July 3rd, 2022, which is a Sunday, we have a poster presentation competition where all the PRMP projects will be presented in front of an esteemed panel of judges. I hope that you all will participate actively in the audience question and answer round. And on behalf of International Society of Chronic Illnesses, I would like to thank our, all our panelists, Dr. Nader Asan, Dr. Duha uh, Sherha, Dr. Avantika Chaitanya, Dr. Sharon Javari, Dr. Tarun Kumar. Thank you for spending your time with us and providing such insightful advices to our students. Today, we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts and this will surely be going to encourage us in further events. Now, I would like to thank all the ISEA members who have been a wonderful audience today. Please feel free to contact us on our email, contact at isei.info in case of any queries. Thank you and have a great day. We'll meet again tomorrow at 8 p.m. IHT. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, Thank you very much, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Bye. 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 and the ISEL for Bye. inviting Thank us. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It was a lot of fun. It was Bye. a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, hello, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, sorry, ma'am. Actually, I mailed you today morning. I missed a June 26th meeting. So, um, again, uh, what is actually the meeting for, ma'am? What happened? You know? Yes. So, uh, on June 26th, we had an introductory meet for the peer research mentorship program. I believe you are a member for July to December. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I received the mail and I... I sent you my resume and my terms and conditions signing off from you. You also replied me back. Mom, okay, awesome. Me. So we will be adding you to our WhatsApp groups uh, this week or maximum two to three days later. And okay. if you if there is any delay, we'll let you know by email. Yeah. Uh, okay, mom, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So I think, uh, Mr. Somnath, uh, do you have any queries that we can solve for you? And uh, Mr. Karupia, we are having a, 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 an organizing meet uh, afterwards. So if you don't have any queries. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. I'm relieved from the meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Somnath, do you have any? Okay. No problem. You'll be added to our WhatsApp groups um, later this week and you'll get all the information from there. So you um, will get the information that you've missed. Don't worry. Okay. Bye, Somna. Thank you. Great one. I'll just um, close. Um, Abhay, could you give me the host privileges? I'll I'll enable the, the waiting room. I'll 